Monday Night Raw, number 217, July 7th, 1997, the day after the Calgary Stampede show. They recapped that show, especially the fan support the Heart Foundation got from their hometown crowd. Then Brett came out for a promo. They announced he would challenge The Undertaker at SummerSlam. He emphasized he was not anti-American as much as he was pro-Canadian. And he ran down America. He said in Canada, they take care of the sick of the old. They have health control, control. They have health care and gun control, but no racism, he claimed. He vowed to win the world title for the fifth time. And if not, he would never wrestle on American soil again. So he wanted to bring out the man who beat the American scum last night, his brother Owen. And they were in Edmonton, so all the hearts were wearing oiler sweaters to suck up to the crowd. Brett promised Owen would destroy Steve Austin at the SummerSlam. Brought out, brought out Davy Boy Smith. They were all standing there, standing there, standing in the ring, as they. <laughs> Do you like a assistance here in this? I uh, almost want to start the show over, but we're too far into it now. So they're watching the Canadian national anthem on the screen. This is the waving maple leaf flag. And then Steve Austin interrupts, jumps them from behind, whacks them all with the chairs, and runs away before they can recover. And he's cackling up the ramp, and he's getting booed, but there are also still some cheers, because damn it, he's Steve Austin. The SummerSlam is coming, as Bred made abundantly clear every single time somebody came down to the ring. Yes. He will be getting a championship match at the SummerSlam. Owen is going to be facing Steve Austin at the SummerSlam. And British Bulldog will annihilate Ken Shamrock at the SummerSlam. Yes. So anyway, they went to the Calgary Stampede, and they were over like gods. And I think everybody knew going in that they were going to be popular in Canada, even though they were heels in the U.S. But I believe that everybody was just caught completely off guard with exactly how popular they were. This was front page news in Calgary. This was front page news in Edmonton, where Raw took place. Bret Hart... I don't know how many people have watched Wrestling with Shadows in the last couple of years. But when you watch it in 2016, it's preposterous. Yeah. The idea that Bret Hart doesn't want to lose a belt to Shawn Michaels, mm -hmm. it's, it's ridiculous. But when you look back, when you look at it through 1997 eyes... When you look at Bret Hart as he comes out here, and Bret Hart was not just like a wrestler. This is not when Dean Ambrose goes to Cincinnati or wherever and the people cheer a little bit louder than if he's in Florida. Mm -hmm. This guy was a mainstream major sports star in Canada. He was a newspaper front page headline athlete. So when you look back... And everything that went down in 1997, it becomes quite obvious why this man was willing to lose to a man he loathed. He hated Shawn Michaels. He was willing to lose to this man anywhere except in Canada. Vince McMahon, when he re-signed Bret Hart, gave Bret Hart creative control in his contract. Bret could have said, I will not lose to anybody anywhere. But Bret was willing to lose the belt not only to a guy like Ken Shamrock, but to a guy like Shawn Michaels, who he hated with a passion. He just won he did not want to do it in the land where he was a god. It makes no sense nowadays. Because there's nobody in wrestling who is so beloved where they are from as Bret Hart was in 1997. I can't think of one person. That's true. Who goes back to their hometown and gets front page headlines when they're on Raw in their hometown? Nobody. I don't think anyone does, no. There's nobody. So it's just funny to look back and see all of this building up. And nowadays people scoff at the Montreal screw job, think the whole thing is a work. It was deadly serious in 1997 for a lot of reasons. Great promo. It was a tremendous promo. Great opening angle. So during the break, Brett cuts a promo saying you can walk all over him. You can walk all over his family, but you can't walk all over Canada. And Vince issues a public apology for Austin's actions interrupting the Canadian anthem. Taka Michinoku versus The Great Sasuke with Brian Christopher on commentary. Sasuke cut an inset promo entirely in Japanese. Yeah. So they had a Michinoku pro match on Raw. The announcers had no idea how to call it. Cameraman had no idea how to shoot it. Best part of this was Taka goes for an acai moonsault and his foot slips 
and it's a terrible disaster. But in midair, he is able to turn it into a diving back elbow, and he went back and hit the moonsault anyway. It was so cool, I don't think people noticed. Meanwhile, commentators were saying things like, these two Japs, they're like kamikaze pilots. Great. That's all great. Vince said they were going pell-mell as Sasuke busted out the space flying tiger drop. And after a few minutes of intense back and forth action, Sasuke hit a thunder powerbomb for the win. And in, in the eyes of 2016, as a man who's watched the cruiserweights and the X Division matches and everything in Ring of Honor for many years now, this is nothing special. But you have to remember this is 1997, and this, these fans have been watching big lugs like the Godwins for years. So this is pretty revolutionary. It's pretty good, but it was not as exciting as the matches on Nitro because the Raw ring is big. And so even if you took the exact same match out of a WCW ring and you put it in a WWF ring, it would have been slower because there's more distance that needs to be covered when they run and do high spots. This reminded me of there's a match on Nitro that we watched tonight as well. I think it was a match with Hoovy where both matches were a lot of fun and they were very exciting, but there was no psychology whatsoever. They just did a whole bunch of crazy moves. One crazy move after another. And I've seen a lot of Cruiserweight matches with a lot of psychology. This was not one of them, but they did a lot of neat moves. And yes, it was one giant racial slur on commentary mm -hmm. for five straight minutes. Mostly by Brian Christopher and Jerry Lawler. Well, entirely. Vince was just ignorant. Yes. Vince was legitimately ignorant. The uh, Lawlers were deliberately being offensive. Savio Vega versus Crush. Oh, fuck. Speaking of race relations. Crush was so bad that he made Savio Vega look bad. And Savio Vega is very good. All I know is two things. One, uh, this is a race war, this whole gimmick. And in Canada, the white boys are popular. Two, there's a point in this match where Crush threw a boot with his right leg and Savio tried to duck under the left leg. I thought, I can't believe that actually happened. And then a minute later, they did the same thing the opposite way. Crush tried to duck, duck under the wrong leg on a kick. It was amazing. Savio takes the laziest bump ever for a clothesline. An eight-way brawl breaks out and the ref calls for the DQ. So in the brawl afterwards, the DOA is out there on their motorcycles, and the Harris twins pick up a Bariqua. They press him over the heads, and they drop him face first under the Harley. And the guy looked like he hurt his hand, because if you've ever seen a Harley Davidson, there's no way to land on this and protect yourself. It's all curves and bumps. There's no nice flat surface to land on. It's like somebody thought of this, who had never been arrested before, but they're backstage, and they said, hey, drop him on the damn bike. Gee, I wonder who that might have been. I can only imagine who might have been. Maybe the same guy who wrote it 47 segments for last week's show. This show, as a show, is better than last week's show. But the stink is starting to come to the top here. DQ finished for a race war. Write that down. <laughs> There's rules in race wars. Paul Barry did a backstage promo. <laughs> this was so hated. I mentioned this last week. It was just as hated, if not more, this week. But goddamn, Paul Bear still is so awesome. Vince wants to know, Paul, you made a very serious accusation last week. Would you like to apologize to The Undertaker? Now, he did not say what Paul had said, but Paul, of course, had called The Undertaker a murderer. And Vince wanted to know if he would apologize. And Paul cannot even believe the question. And he explains, I am not going to apologize He's the one that did the killering. <laughs> he did say that. <laughs> the killering. The killering. Yes, uh, he said, Kane, poor Kane, had to grow up over the last 20 years going through skin grafts and surgeries, unable to go into the sun because of his scars. And his only solace was the possibility that one day he would get to go face to face with the Undertaker, the man he hated most. And he repeated his claim that Taker was a murderer, and he made faces only Paul Bearer could make. This is so amazing when you think about the current corporate Kane. Doing better. <laughs> <laughs> He's doing a lot better. I've never seen such a recovery. I seems to, be getting, seems to be getting plenty of sun. This was totally preposterous. Yes. Although after the final deletion, I took this very seriously. Trying to... I take everything seriously now. <laughs> trying to imagine 
Like, if the final deletion had happened 20 years ago, would I look back at this Undertaker and Kane stuff and not be so upset about it? Uh, how dumb it is. British Bulldog and Owen Hart versus Farouk and D'Lo Brown in the finals of this lousy tournament. At least this was a good match before they did the crap finish. They were in Canada, so of course Bulldog and Davy Boy were the, or Bulldog and Owen were the uh, babyface team. Austin cuts a backstage promo saying it doesn't matter who his partner is because everyone sucks. Vince was outraged at this language and cut him off. No, it was because he told Vince to shut up. I see. And Vince said, you're out of line, and he cut his mic. Yes. I laughed so hard. Because of all the times I've cut your mic for being out that of line. That could be it. That could be it. So Maybe that's where I got it. Back to Jerry Lawler and uh, unfortunate racial commentary. Delo's in there, and Lawler's like, this guy's got no athletic background. He just grew up on the streets. Jim Ross says, actually, he's played NC2A football. He's a college graduate. He's a CPA. He's smarter than you, Jerry. Had plenty of time to have a good match. Set up the hot tag. Owen makes this big comeback. And it's awesome. And Canada's going crazy. And then it turns into a giant brawl on the floor. And Let me Owen talk about this brawl. All hell breaks loose. And Brian Pillman runs over and starts beating the shit out of everybody with a flagpole. Mm -hmm. Right in front of the referee. Yes. The referee does not DQ him no. for assaulting people with the Canadian flag. Owen gets back inside, and the ref counts everyone else out who's being hit with a flag outside. <laughs> yeah. This was blatant referee bias bullshit. Hometown, man. <laughs> Can't beat the hometown officiating. Man. I like that in the finals of the tag team tournament in Canada, Owen can't pin D'Lo Brown. No. Must win by count out. He pinned Steve Austin the night before at the fucking Calgary Yes. Stampede. We can't pin D'Lo Brown here in the finals of the tournament to see who will face Fucking Austin. Jimmy Corderas. That was a referee. Bastard. Canadian. Was he? Yep. Did not know that. Yep. I knew it. I knew this was bias. You cannot come to ringside and hit some fuckers with a flagpole. That's not allowed. There should be rules. Especially when you're assaulting people with a flagpole and the ref counts those people out. Yeah. I mean, come on. Nobody brought this up. So it's Owen and Bulldog versus Austin and a partner in the finals. And Mankind ran out in a Steve Austin t-shirt to jaw jack with Owen and Bulldog a bit. You know, I know that everybody loves all of this stuff with Steve Austin and Mankind and everything like that. And I'm sure it was probably Russo's idea. I don't want to denigrate it just because it's Russo's idea. And it does lead to some really fun stuff. But the idea that Mankind is now a wacky, pandering babyface who wants nothing more than to be Steve Austin's friend. This is ridiculous. This is more ridiculous than everything that's going on with Paul Bearer. No. Yeah. No. Paul Bearer is... Accusing a man of getting away with murder for 20 years after he teamed with him for 10 years. And claiming this, uh, he has had secret knowledge of a young boy who was believed to be dead in a fire, but in fact, Paul Bearer knows where he is. This is just, mankind is a weirdo who spent his whole life locked in a basement. He thought Paul Bearer was his friend, and then Paul Bearer abandoned him, and now he's looking for another friend. Austin did another backstage promo. He ran down Hunter Hearst Helmsley and said he was not above punching out China. Which led to Steve Austin versus Hunter Hearst, Hunter Hearst Helmsley, wherein they were openly teasing that if you stay tuned, you might get to see Steve Austin punch a woman. You know, Hunter is a great wrestler today, but Hunter was so fucking boring in 1997. You didn't like this? No, that's my point. Ah. Steve Austin, it must have been the Calgary Stampede reaction and the reaction of these fans here in Edmonton. But this was a classic match where Steve Austin came out and he just dragged excitement out of Triple H's boring 1997 ass. They had a great fucking match. It was a great match. This is true. Until Hunter got the heat. And then it just <laughs> slowed well, to a glacial crawl. Well, let's stop there for a second. Hunter got the heat because Steve Austin was getting cheered even though he'd interrupted the Canadian anthem just an hour earlier. Because he's Steve Austin. So, uh, yes, Hunter gets the heat for a while. China grabs a chair, puts it on the apron. Then she takes the ref. Hunter grabs the chair. Mankind runs out. Hunter sees him coming, hits him with a chair, and then turns around and eats a stunner for the pin. So Austin beats Hunter. Hunter and China disappear. Austin cuts a promo. He demands Mankind get in the ring. He says he didn't like Mankind at all, but he'd go to war with him any time. 
And if Mankind were to shake his hand, they'd be tag team partners. Mankind wanted a big hug instead, and Austin obliged. And in, I don't know if it was a shock in 97, but in 2016, it was blatantly obvious that Austin was going to stun this man. And in fact, he did. He laid him out with a stunner. <laughs> he said Mankind would never be his partner because he was a long-haired freak and he sucked. Pretty goddamn good reason, actually. Well, kind of. On the list of reasons, that's a good one. I, I just like the, he thinks Mankind's a long-haired freak. He just wrestled Hunter Hearst Helmsley, whose hair is much longer. Well, he doesn't like him either. Man, he doesn't. That's his point. Is he also a long-haired freak? I don't freak? like you because you're a long-haired freak and you suck. Hmm. Steve Austin used to have long hair. Yeah. But he had to cut off because he went bald. Yes. So he hates long-haired freaks. Ah, I hadn't thought of it. It's envy. I thought it was obvious. All right. Mankind cut a promo saying he only wanted a friend, and now it's obvious that drastic measures were necessary. He vowed that next week, the WWF, Steve Austin, and Mankind would never be the same. I will give them credit. And I don't even think this was done on purpose. But when they did those series of videos with Jim Ross, where they were trying to humanize Mankind, and he's talking about his life growing up, and now when he was a youngster, all he wanted to be was the sexy boy, dude love. And it never worked out for him. And we have a situation where Steve Austin and Shawn Michaels win the tag team titles. Shawn Michaels gets in a legit backstage fight with Bret Hart and threatens to quit the company. Steve Austin now does not have a partner. They've been building up a deal with Mick Foley and Steve Austin. And it fucking falls into place so perfectly. Yes. That mankind decides he's going to come back as dude love to replace Shawn fucking Michaels. Yes. It is an amazing twist of fate. If you will. This, you know what's so great about 1997? Was so much shit just happened. Yeah. <laughs> you know I'm what I mean? So much random chance. Like you could have, you could have written, you could have found the very best professional writing, wrestling writers. And they could never write a year like 1997. Because never again in wrestling history will so much shit like this happen. I don't think it ever happened before, and I'm not sure it ever happened since. I'm pretty sure that's true. All of this craziness is outrageous, and it's making for such great television. It really is. I mean, really, you knew they were going to do something involving USA versus Canada, but the organic reaction of the Canadians at Calgary Stampede and this show in Edmonton just accelerated it, and they, they went with it. This year is the most amazing year in wrestling history so far that I've seen. It probably seen. is. I think, I think it's crazy. I think that was true going in. Eric Shelley versus Brian Christopher. Not the most amazing thing I ever saw. Lawler accepted a challenge for a tag match next week with Ivan and Scott Putsky, which led to, of course, Polish jokes. So I was distracted by the crowd here. One guy in the crowd. I'm watching this match. In the background, I suddenly I see a little girl with no shirt being waved in the air. And I re-round to make sure this is exactly what I saw. And that's what I saw. Some man said, I'll take my little girl, take her shirt off, wave her over my head here on Monday Night Raw, and get on TV. And I guess it worked. So, way to go, Canada. That's your guy. Can I talk about my favorite part of this match? Sure. So, I got this fella here. Shelly is his name. This is a light heavyweight match. And earlier, we'd had the great Sasuke and Taka Michinoku doing every crazy, wacky dive in the book. And every time someone did a crazy, wacky dive... Jerry Lawler would ask Brian Christopher, what would you do there? And Brian Christopher would respond to the effect of, I just move out of the way. So they have this match, and they're obviously setting up Brian Christopher against Sasuke. Or Taka, I can't remember who it was, but it doesn't matter. Point of this is, they decide, well, let's do a spot where Shelly goes for a crazy dive, and Brian... You do as you claimed and move out of the way. This fucking Shelly guy was not a diver. <laughs> so they had to go up to the guy, apparently, and say, we need you to do a dive, and Brian is going to move. And Shelly didn't know any fucking dives. So what he did was he ends up getting inside the ring, he grabs the top rope, and there's a vault and a half turn... Kind of a pescado, but kind of not. He fucking misses by a thousand feet. And I, I'm going to hell for this, but I laughed so hard. And I rewound it over and over and over again. This had to have been the only dive this man had ever done in his whole lifetime. And he fucking crashed and burned with such fury 
all so that Brian Christopher can move to set up a future match with Takamichi Noku or the Great Sasuke. You gotta go back and watch this again. So other than that, as I wrote here, they had a sloppy match. Christopher won with a top rope leg drop, and all they hit the ring afterwards, they hit a spike, a spike power driver on Shelly and dared any Canadian to come fight. None did. Austin came out for a promo. I'm just going back over this. This is like the fourth Steve Austin segment on the show. He said they handcuffed him at the end of the show the night before, and Austin was still bending over to flip off the fans. He said Gorilla Monsoon could name any tag team partner he wanted next week. He was going to win the tag titles no matter what. Then he said that if Bret Hart thinks he's going to outshine me by promising to never wrestle in the U.S. if he loses at SummerSlam, I'll one-up him. If I can't beat Owen Hart at SummerSlam, I will get down on my knees and I will kiss Owen's ass. My mind was blown when I heard this. If you remember, this is the match yes. where Owen Hart gives Steve Austin a pile driver and nearly kills the guy. Yeah. Steve Austin can barely move. He's virtually paralyzed. Yet, Owen stumbles over him and pins himself to make sure that Steve Austin wins the title. And of course, you really think about it nowadays, and it's like, you know, the match would have been stopped, the doctor would have been in there, there's no way they would have allowed this match to continue. But when, when you realize what the stipulation was, you realize what had to have been going through oh, Owen's head. I cannot win. I cannot beat this guy. Yeah. If I fucking beat this guy, I'll be fired. Yeah. Because he's going to have to kiss my bare ass. And so he had to force himself to find a way to get beaten by Steve Austin. God, it's just amazing. There's another one. So amazing in hindsight. Goldust could cut a quick backstage promo on Bret Hart. And then we got Goldust versus Bret. They showed the Hart family celebrating at the end of the pay-per-view the night before. It was heartbreaking watching Owen in the corner holding his young son. Mm. So here's what this match was. Goldust and Brett did stuff in the ring as half the crew came out to watch. DOA came out on their bikes. Hart Foundation came out. Shamrock came out. Legion of Doom came out. Austin came out. Everyone stood there and Vince was talking about it. It's a powder keg. Someone's going to light a light a match. There's going to be a spark and all hell's going to break loose. And then Brett, as he has done so many times, countered a sunset flip into a cradle for the win. A completely inconsequential match. And then nothing happened. And they went off the air. It wasn't even like... Brett is limping. And he gets the heat on gold dust. And he's working him over like a heel. Didn't work at all like a Canadian babyface fighting from underneath. Fans loved it the whole time. I laughed my ass off when one crew after another came out to watch. And of course, historically in wrestling, you don't see it much anymore, but back in the day, the locker room would empty to watch a classic match. And I'm thinking, the locker room's emptying and they're watching Bret Hart versus fucking Gold Dust yes. in the lamest match on this whole show. And yeah, that was it. A very, very weird match, but a good show. All right, let me see if I can pull my best Vince here. <clears throat> Monday Night Raw. This was July 14th, 1997, emanating from San Antonio, Texas. Wow. Yes, sir. I bet you Ed was there. I don't know. Probably. Okay, so first out, the uh, Heart Foundation comes out. It's another week where Brett talks about uh, how much better Canada is. He mentions, and I was a little confused by this, Brett mentions that he rid he he talks about ridding Edmonton of rats. That's what he said. And said there was probably plenty of rats here in San Antonio. That's what he said. Yeah. I don't know how he ridded Edmonton of rats. Now, did he have a flute? And did he, he lead said. them out? Or are we talking about the wrestling jargon rat? Wink wink. Well, it's funny you should mention that. Because I have, in fact, gone to the history of rat control in Alberta. Okay. Which, I swear to God, is an official government website. Hmm. It says here, Norway rats are one of the most destructive creatures known to man. They destroy and contaminate untold quantities of food. And through their tunneling activities, undermine the foundations of buildings, sewer, and water lines, and city streets. The people of Alberta 
are extremely fortunate not to have rats. Hmm. This is not by chance, but by design. For the past four decades, Alberta has had a program to keep rats out of the province. They built a wall! <laughs> Publication describes the evolution, history, and current status of the rat control program in Alberta and discuss, discusses factors which contribute to its success. So, in fact, there is some sort of program, since this thing is 5,000 words long, it's like an observer, I'm not going to read it, but they claim that there are, in fact, no rats in Alberta. Except around wrestling buildings. Maybe I will clear that up with Lance the next time he's on the show. It's very interesting. The Norway rat, you say? The Norway rat. My people are strong. Sure. Yeah. Anyway, he goes on to talk about how if he doesn't win on Sunday, that he will never wrestle in the U.S. again. And Vince quickly interrupts him and says, no, no, no. If you lose on Sunday, you will never wrestle in the U.S. again. Or did I get that? You got that backwards. backwards. He, if he does not win the WWF title at the SummerSlam, right. he can never wrestle in the United States ever again. Okay. I apologize. Next up was Owen. He pulled out a tube of bliss stick and tells Austin that he better pucker up because he's going to kiss his butt come SummerSlam. He's going to kiss his ass. Yes, that's what he said. He made sure to emphasize the word ass yes, so Vince. that Vince would be appalled and Brett would laugh. That's exactly what happened. And then uh, after that, we got Davy Boy Smith. He said that if he does not win the European Championship from Ken Shamrock, he will eat a can of dog food. Immediately after the match. Next up was Brian Pillman. Crazy Brian Pillman, if there is any other way to describe him. Brian Pillman uh, said that he will face gold dust at the SummerSlam. He puts over Dusty Rhodes for being a terrible dad and neglecting his son and uh, said he would wear a dress. One of Marlena's dresses. Yes. And it would not be the only thing that he got into of hers, he noted. Filthy man. And Jim Neidhart. Thank you, sir. Jim Neidhart said that if any of them lose, he would cut off his goatee. The next night on Raw. The next night on Raw. I don't remember that. I don't either. I vaguely remember the dog food. I do not remember the goatee shaving. I definitely remember the dress. But that's it. So maybe maybe Neidhart was gone by then. I don't even remember. I guess we'll find out. Well, after seeing his match tonight, he should have been. Brett said this is commitment. The, Cana the Canadian women are prettier. The money is prettier. The sports are tougher. The men are tougher. The beer tastes better. And it will be a Canadian summer whether the Americans like it or not. That is correct. I will add, by the way, obviously they were booed like crazy here in America. And then Steve Austin came out. The American flag is behind him on the Titan Tron. Shamrock, the Patriot. Mm-hmm. Psycho Sid and Shawn Michaels all come out, and everybody's going absolutely crazy. All I could think was, U.S. versus Canada is a thousand times more fun, and at the same time, a thousand times less controversial than these goddamn race wars. <laughs> That's very true. And the fans are more rabid, oddly enough. So that was that. The first match of the night was Jerry, the King Lawler, and Brian Christopher versus Ivan and Scott Putsky. Yeah. This match was a ton of fun. This match was awesome because of Jerry Lawler and Brian Christopher. Absolutely. Because Scott Putsky sucks. Mm -hmm. Ivan Putsky sucked when he was in his prime, and he was 55 years old here. Mm -hmm. And they didn't have any, him have do anything until the comeback, which was essentially him just swinging his arms like a wild man and sending men flying, and then hitting the Polish hammer on Jerry Lawler and getting the pin. The place went crazy for this. Lawler and Brian Christopher were such a great old-school heel tag team. I think a lot of fans in 2016 would be bored by this match. Those fans are wrong. This is excellent tag team wrestling action. This was a match that made me want to go back in a time machine 19 years so that I could work with Jerry Lawler and Brian Christopher in Memphis in a tag match, even if I had Vinny as a partner. <laughs> I loved every moment of this. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. Uh, Ivan Putsky is 56 years old. 
He came out at the beginning of the match and sang my Mel my melody of love, and he did a horrendous job. Um, apparently he did this all the time. I've seen very little of the man, but apparently this was. So you've seen enough, exactly. But um, in the end, uh, Brian Christopher missed a Tennessee jam, hot tagged Ivan. He ran wild and uh, Polish hammers for everyone and got the win. Fine action. Yeah, it was fun. Uh, something that um, wrestling is missing today is bumbling fool heels that just run into each other, and it's just a big clown show. And I, even the horsemen used to do it. It's just tremendous and uh, sorely missing from today. We have Paul Bearer up next. Uh, JR was out with him, and he said that, um, well, in a nutshell, he's going to prove that Kane is alive next week on Raw. He's going to prove that he's alive. Huh. I, don't, I don't remember this at all. Uh, it must have been lame proof. Do you have a picture? DNA sample? What did he have? I strongly suspect in 1997 he did not present the DNA of Kane. But maybe he did. I don't know. No. Next up, Takuma Chinoku versus, as they said, Tajiri Yoshihiro. It was actually Tajiri Yoshihiro against Taka Michinoko. It fucked everything up. Yes. I don't know how you missed the U on the end of Taka's name, but Taka Michinoko. That's better than Taco Michinoko. That's that's true. Anyway, this match was great. Uh, Taka got a video package and showed off uh, the moves that he had done from the last two matches with Sasuke. Um, Taka gave uh, Tajiri a dropkick to the floor early and hit the big springboard plancha. Uh, just awesome. He's He was tremendous. I haven't seen him in years, but I would imagine he's still pretty decent. Uh, back inside, Tajiri powerbombs Michinoku down. Um, Taka, he hits Taka with something resembling an o Oklahoma roll, but he uses his feet instead. Apparently to disorient the man, it looked wacky. Uh, they end up back outside. Tajiri hits an acai. Um, really pretty. I forgot how great Tajiri's high flying actually is. Back inside, they trade open-handed slaps that were very loud, so they were hitting each other very hard. Tajiri hit a roundhouse kick to the back of Taka's head. Looked absolutely brutal. A dragon suplex by Tajiri for a two count. Uh, Taka quickly rallied back, hit a missile drop kick to the back of, he back of his head, and followed it with the Michinoku driver for the three count. A fine play-by-play, -play, Granny. If only you'd messed up every name, you would hold a candle to her recaps. This was pretty good. Yeah. This was way better than whatever they did last week. I think it was Taka versus... Who did Taka face last week? I've I, already forgotten. I was absent. What did he face last week? Who's the, other, who's the other Japanese fellow they've got? Sasuke? That's right. Great Sasuke. This was better than that. Really? Because this had more... This had better psychology. That's funny because I remember the... Sasuke Taka match was better on Raw than it was at the pay per view. Well, all I know is watching this in 2016, this match had significantly better psychology. It actually was a match, unlike the other one, which was just a bunch of high flying. Taka was so over with this crowd. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they do these cruiserweight slash light heavyweight matches and nobody gives a shit. But the fans were so into this that it's like you would have to be blind to not see. That you could get these guys over. But they didn't. They were just little guys that had exciting matches on the mid card. And then they were forgotten about. And I should have said the crowd for tonight's Raw was absolutely rabid. Compared to the... This was the best American crowd for Raw. Probably in all of the 90s up to that point. It's very possible. When was it hotter in this country? I can't think of a time. I, got me. We're then taken back to the locker room. Ken Shamrock is there telling us that he will not be Steve Austin's partner. He was out there to show support for the Heart, against the Heart Foundation. And he said, besides, I've got a match tonight with Jim the Anvil Nightheart. Oh, God forbid we cancel that match so you can fight for the tag team titles, you fucking moron. That match sucked. Yes, and then he told uh, Anvil it was time to knuckle up. Dude, it's time to pack up and... Get out of WWF. 
They showed footage of the Los Bariquas oh my God. coming into the Coliseum. Uh, stereotypical lowrider car uh, tricked out uh, with hydraulics, blah, 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 blah. An embarrassment. It really is. Also in the back, we have the headbangers. Mosh makes a stupid joke about them possibly facing Cheech and Chong tonight. Because you see, Cheech and Chong look just like the Los Periquas. Yeah. Because they're Mexican. Because they're not white. Right. Yeah. Funny. No? No. Okay. Which leads us to the match, the Headbangers versus Miguel Perez and Jose Estrada Jr. This fucking match sucked. I'm sure it lit the Nielsens on fire. Miguel won with a hairy rolling cradle. <laughs> and then we had a Puerto Rican gang beating, mm -hmm. leading to a biker gang coming down to make the save, which actually was just them riding their bikes down to the ring and revving their engines right. while the Puerto Ricans stood around like idiots. Everything about this segment sucked. Everything. Yeah, the uh, announcers made sure to name the bikes by name. They were Titan motorcycles. Oh, wow. I don't know if that had anything to do with anything, but... Because Titan Sports, I'm sure. Yeah, exactly. Wanted to get that plug in. Next up, uh, the Patriot was backstage. Or as they called him, Del Wilkes. Well, that was his name. I know. I realize that this has been done many times in wrestling, but the idea that you have a masked man... But you refer to him by his real name. Mm. It totally defeats the purpose. I understand. That's weird. It is. Plus, you got somebody called the Patriot, and he's wearing a patriotic mask and a patriotic tights. Really no reason to bring up his name, because obviously he's an American. And if you heard him talk, he's definitely American. Southern American, to be exact. Dale Wilkes. Anyway, he said he was not going to be Austin's partner either tonight. He just wants to beat up anybody who doesn't speak, who speaks out against American. I almost screwed that up. Next up, we have Vince out in the ring. He's going to bring out Shawn Michaels for his big return interview. He asks him if he's going to be Austin's partner. Michael says he's not 100%, but that never stopped him from performing before. But that's completely up to Stone Cold Steve Austin. Well, he noted that the last time that they won the titles together, neither was 100%. So he'd go right now if he wanted to, but it was up to Austin. When they won the titles, I think Shawn Michaels was at 200%. Because that match ruled. Shawn quickly changes gears and addresses Bret Hart. So he's looking forward to Bret never wrestling on U.S. soil again. He brings up SummerSlam and he says it wasn't his choice not to be part of it, but he got down on his knees and appealed to Vince to let him be part of SummerSlam. He said he'll sell souvenirs, he'll sell tickets, he'll set up the ring. He'll he even get set up the damn ring. He probably doesn't know how. Give me a break. Yeah, he probably knows how. He said he'll even shine Vince's shoes and the sight of Shawn Michaels on his knees and Vince McMahon grinning ear to ear. Well, I'll let you do the math there. No? All right, just me then. Anyway, he says he just wants a ticket to SummerSlam. He wants to be there to witness Undertaker defeating Bret Hart and running him out of the country. Uh, Sean tries to strip, and Vince grabs a towel, and they play grab ass, and they go to commercial. What a weird duo. I'll say... Okay, hour number two starts. Lawler joins the announce team. Savio Vega is running down to the ring with a mic in his hand, and he's uh, screaming. He's grabbing a cameraman. He's shouting, there's been an accident backstage. They run backstage as Los, Los Barik was um, tearing up one of DOA's bikes. A Titan bike. A Titan bike. What about you never-do-wells? Never-do-wells. Or as they pronounce it, ne'er-do-wells. I see. Hooligans. Mm -hmm. miscreants mm -hmm. back there destroying these guys' bikes for no good reason that I can figure. I mean, maybe there'd been an attack somewhere, but is that any reason to destroy private property? Well, no, there's never and a good reason. better yet, or worse yet, it sucked. <laughs> so there was a fight, and they hit each this other. It's like the Wyatts on Raw. No, it wasn't that bad. Actually, it wasn't that good. 
I don't know. I kind of like the Wyatt thing. Kind of. I didn't. Fair enough. I hated it. Well, I hated it. And and were you comparing it to Matt Hardy from last well, week? Of course I was. But well, even if go. that if even if that had never happened, they shook that camera. <laughs> they turned the camera upside down. Yeah. They did wacky filters, mm-hmm. all sorts of goofiness. It was terrible. Okay. Like if they'd just been out in the woods in the dark and had a brawl, that probably would have been pretty good. But they they had to make it cinematic. Right. And that's the problem. Raw is not cinema. Raw is not <laughs> Lucha well, Underground. If you ask Triple H, it is cinema. No, he's because an idiot, they're making man. movies. No, they're not making movies. They're making a they're making a show, a television show that is a faux sports television show. I understand. If you want to make a movie, then everything should be a movie. Then film it t- film it all on film and go out in the woods and everything's great. That's why Lucha Underground works. But to have a to have a show that's supposed to be like a football game, just everybody's wrestling. And in the middle of it, you got a fucking goofy film. It sucked. It was just totally out of context and the goddamn film shaking. <laughs> that that may have been my biggest problem with it. Well, obviously. People vomited watching that. Vomited, you say? Yeah. J- you mean just you or? No, people. They- just like when Freddie Blassie used to wrestle and people would have heart attacks and die. People vomited watching this thing. Yeah, you have proof of this? Yeah, my Twitter. It sucked. Everything about it sucked. But People I will say, on Twitter? I think that this sucked more because this involved the Los Bariquas mm. and those other geeks That's having a having a fight nobody could care about, right? Where nothing happened. Yeah, they hit each other with trash cans, and in the end, uh, refs and agents came out to break up the fight. Los Bariquas hopped in their car, and the bike was chained to the back of it, and they drove off, dragging it away. Expensive bike. I am. They just drug it away. And then the show hit a low point. Do some searching. Ken Shamrock versus Jim the Anvil Nightheart. To say that Nightheart was not on his game tonight would be like saying to a man in the path of a tidal wave, you're going to experience moisture. Thank you, Jerry. He was no good. You know, TJ Wilson's a great guy. Yeah, he is. Married to Natty. Birthday this last week. It was a couple days ago. So I feel bad having to bury Natty's father. Right. Holy shit, he was horrible in this match. TJ, your wife is better than your father-in-law. Both of you are better than the Anvil. That's fair to say. It was so bad. And then they're having a horrible match. (laughs) And Shamrock goes behind the guy and puts him in a sleeper hold (laughs) no no you're missing something before that we'll get to that but let me just get over the finish here because i can i can't get over it i've got to i've got to talk about it like i'm in therapy Mm. shamrock puts him in a standing rear naked choke Mm -hmm. and the anvil just stands there right and then the referee gets in close and rings the bell yes anvil doesn't sell he doesn't tap he doesn't verbally submit Mm -mm. he doesn't sell it during he doesn't sell it after right what the fuck was this now, the point you're missing is right before that, Ken Shamrock went for a Hurricane Rana. Anvil took a forward roll and somehow ended up standing on his feet. He no-sold a Hurricane Rana, and then they went to the sleeper. As you stated, no verbal submission, no tap, nothing. And as Anvil is on his knees, you can see him look over at the announce table. As if to gauge Vince's expression, I'm guessing this sucked. Anvil threw some punches. He applied a chin lock and that was it. This is so bad. Why do they keep putting Anvil in the ring on television? I don't know. Especially because like Ken Shamrock, Ken Shamrock is so much better than he should be. Right. He was a wrestler, but it was a decade earlier. He was an indie guy, and now here he is, and he's only had a few matches. And granted, he's been wrestling guys that are, like, really good. Mm-hmm. But, man, you're putting Ken Shamrock in the ring on live television with the anvil? Right. Yeah, that's silly. It's a terrible match. So, anyway, also, maybe something that could have happened. I did notice that after this, Davy Boy did run down to ringside. Perhaps. Just Perhaps. Maybe Davey Boy missed his cue. Yeah, but it was it was a submission. 
Why didn't the ref just stand there and wait for Davey? Why do you ring the bell? This is like an early Montreal screw job, but in this <laughs> case, the referee made the right call. This was the San Antonio this screw This sucked. Job. So anyway, Davey Boy runs down and they start laying the boots to Shamrock. And then who should make the save but the Patriot, Del Wilkes. He runs down and grabs Owen and Bulldog and hits them both with a move that he calls the Uncle Slam. Mm. Cool. Yeah. It's basically just a full Nelson slam. Vince tried to speak to Mankind about teaming with Austin. No response from the shadowy figure. Next up was the Legion of Doom versus the new Blackjacks. Well, they did have a commercial here. They're still doing clues. Oh, yeah. To try to get you to win a million dollars. By the way, at the convention, on Sunday after I left, everybody was going to play mini golf, and I forget who it was, but somebody was hanging out in the Rio, and right next to him, some lady pulled the handle and won a million dollars. Wow. Told Granny that she almost had a heart attack. Could have been her. She's betting about a nickel, maybe oh, a dime. Yeah. And finally, she turns to me and goes, I refuse to bet less than a dollar from now on. Hmm. Like, wow. Well, it's a good strategy, Granny. Keep him guessing. I'll let her tell her gambling stories on Thursday's show. Please. Anyway, as the Legion of Doom was coming down for this match, the Godwins attacked them from behind with a steel chair. You know, Craig. Yes, sir. A couple of weeks ago, you were talking about the Legion of Doom and how sad it was that they were feuding with hog farmers. Yes, sir. And I was like, Christ, Craig, dude, who cares? It's, it's 1997. It's a Legion of Doom. Their prime was 10. Then I watched this. Mm -hmm. And I was like, my God, the Legion of Doom is feuding with fucking hog farmers. Yes, Brian. What the fuck? Were they feuding know. with hog farmers for? The bigger question is, I don't even, as I really think about it, I don't care, much like I did in a couple Fair. of weeks ago, but when I really think about it, why were there even hog farmers in 1997? Why were we still booking hog farmers? Aren't we over that yet? I haven't seen Freddie Joe Floyd in months. They got rid of fake Diesel and fake Kevin Nash. Why do we fucking still have hog farmers? They're like the last shitty gimmick. Let me pose this to you then. Why does ROH have chicken farmers? They're legit chicken farmers. Maybe these were legit hog They're farmers. They're not. I know. And they don't come out there with chickens. <laughs> Do they? Not that I'm aware of. This feud sucks. And then Hawk's selling for these hog farmers. Yeah. Well, he didn't really have to sell because he got busted open on the back of the head with a chair from Henry O'Godwin. Uh, they... Hit the slop drop on the uh, on the ramp there, and uh, Vince sold the uh, the blood on the back of Hawk's head like the y ramp. Did yes, it. let me let me let me say something. I think it was the ramp actually, just to irritate people further who are so sick of hearing me talk about this. Hawk takes a slop drop on the stage, and he comes up bleeding from the back of the head. Mm -hmm. And Vince mentions this man may have a concussion. Right. There's no way they'll allow him. To get back into the ring in this condition. Hmm. A fucking astonishing statement, seeing as how we didn't know concussions were bad until the mid-2000s. Remember when Brett suffered multiple concussions in WCW? Oh, yeah. And ended his career in, like, the late 90s, and everybody fucking knew exactly why, because he took too many concussions in a short period of time. And I still have to hear fuckers in wrestling tell me that we didn't know the concussions were bad until after Chris Benoit killed his family. Give me a break. You're preaching the choir here, Brian. Next up was my highlight of the uh, retro shows this evening. Vader faced Flash Funk. I had so much fun watching this. You know, I tweeted out, it's a preview for Vader versus Will Ospreay. And some folks from the UK were aghast at me. I understand why. Because they said it's supposed to be a shoot. Excuse me. So I've seen the advertising for Vader versus Will Ospreay, and nowhere in the advertising have I seen anything about it being a shoot. And what? if it is being billed as a shoot, can somebody propose to me which matches on the show for Revolution Pro are shoots and which are works? <laughs> it's not going to be a fucking shoot, nor is it going to be billed as a shoot. Give me a break. And they say kayfabe is dead. 
Oh, who's going to be the shooter? What, what's <laughs> Vader going to go in there and do football tackles? Because he has no martial arts experience whatsoever. <laughs> he has no background in MMA to be, to, to be doing a shoot. Nor, to my knowledge, is Will Ospreay. So it's probably going to be somewhat similar to this match right here, whether it's billed as a shoot or not. Well, they, clearly nobody watched this match before they got mad at me for saying that. Well, why would they? Because Vader went in there, and he just mowed over the guy. Like awesome. he's a big fucking football player beating the hell out of this guy. Mm-hmm. Scorpio did a little bit of high flying, but it's not like he flew all over the place. He was just a high flyer against Vader, mm-hmm. and Vader mowed him down, and every now and then, Flash Funk would do something a little bit spectacular, and they did the finish. There's not a single thing in this match that a 60-year-old Vader and Will Ospreay could not do together, except one moment where Vader took a bump over the top rope to the floor. I don't think Vader's doing that in 2016. No, there's no way. But other than that, standing there and smashing the guy and punching him and uppercuts and a power bomb and Vader splashing in the corner and all of this stuff, Vader can still do all of that. Sure. And I sure as shit hope that Will Ospreay doesn't try to triangle the guy in the middle of this match. (laughs) He better do a little bit of speed and some flying. Mm -hmm. Yes, as you stated, uh, Flash Funk did hit a nice plancha to the floor. Uh, Vader um, was sent into the steps and in a comical fashion. Vader was sent into the steps. He got about two feet away from it, stopped, planted his feet, and thrust his shoulders into the steps. It was very comical. Yeah, I do not think that Will Ospreay will Irish whip Vader into anything. Because that would be preposterous. Yes, because I couldn't even buy Flash Funk whipping him into this. This should have been a reversal. How's Flash Funk Irish whipping Vader? He's 450 pounds or something. That was fake. That was not a shoot spot. No, no, that was not. Anyway, back in the ring, uh, Funk, or excuse me, uh, Vader tries to powerbomb Funk, but he slips out and hits a two, hits a moonsault for a two count. A <laughs> two? A toque. Like yes. in Lord of the Rings? No, it's like a hat. In the uh. Canadians. Anyway, um, Flash, co- <laughs> Flash came off the ropes. Hit- Vader hit him with a body attack. Flash sold this like he was dead. And it was awesome because the crowd was getting hot. And then Vader cupped his ear much like Hogan did. And the fans were losing their mind at this point. He had him. Then... Um, Vader ended up hitting him with another body attack, and then he power bombed him and uh, got the win. And then, for whatever reason, after the match, he gave him the Vader bomb. Because Vader's awesome, and he was awesome in this match. Absolutely. And what the hell are you going to do with Flash Funk? It's a good question. Vince met with Steve Austin and asked him of, about Mankind, if he would be his partner tonight. Austin said how Mankind. Uh, says he isn't going to resort to any drastic measures. Austin says he hasn't been 100% all year long, and every day he gets out of bed, it's a drastic measure. Bottom line is he's not leaving San Antonio without the WWF Tag Team Championship. Leads us to our main event, the vacant WWF titles on the line, Owen Hart and Davey Boy Smith versus Steve Austin and a mystery partner. Mm-hmm. The heels are in first. Austin comes down to the ring, a house fire, beating up everybody. Yeah, let me talk about that. Okay. Austin comes down to the ring. He's working the match by himself mm-hmm. because he's a lone wolf and he doesn't want a fucking partner. And he'll beat up both men on his own and he'll die fighting if he has to. And everybody goes crazy for the guy. It is amazing how perfectly booked Steve Austin was. With the most simple psychology. And for the fucking life of them, they can't do anything like this today in a promotion where they can control who wins, who loses, and exactly how everybody is portrayed. Mm -hmm. And the reason is, it's because they overthink everything. And they think that they need to make it more complicated because this simple stuff doesn't work anymore. Even though they have a secondary brand called NXT, which is the simplest fucking promotion in the world, and it seems to be getting over just fine. As are all of its stars. It's very true. Anyway, Austin comes out of House of Fire. He goes to put the sharpshooter on Owen. Bulldog attacks. He throws Austin outside into the guardrail, then into the steps. Vince then quickly informs us that Austin's partner has arrived. We hear a backbeat of the drums, and we see a pair of white boots, a pair of blue tights, 
and a toe tapping. And they go to commercial. Back in the ring, Austin hits a chop block on Owen. Um, Austin basically is using Steamboat's method. Every time the heels are on, are getting the heat, they'll hit him with three, four moves. Austin will fire back, and they'll cut him off again. This was awesome. Really love this match, by the way. Austin uh, clears the house, waits for him in the ring. He's waiting and waiting and waiting. Both heels are outside. All of a sudden, Mankind appears on the Titan Tron. He's wearing tie-dye. He's wearing round John Lennon-style sunglasses. He says he doesn't blame Austin for not wanting to team with a mutilated freak like Mankind. But how about the hippest cat in the land, Dude Love? He does his promo on the big screen. It's Mankind playing Shawn Michaels. Right. Austin is baffled. Mm -hmm. Owen is baffled. Bulldog is baffled. The fans are so baffled that no one's even cheering. Right. They're just, what? What? Comes down to the ring, starts shaking his ass. Right. Parading around the ring. He gets on the apron. Austin is looking at him. I was just waiting for Austin to stun this fucker in the next week. Right. But instead, Austin gets in the ring. He delivers a boot to Bulldog or whoever. And then he gives Dude Love the hot hand. Yeah. And Dude Love gets in the ring and he starts running wild. Mm -hmm. So he's running wild. And then he wants to give a tag to Austin. But now Austin doesn't want to get back in the ring. So Dude Love's running wild in there. And... They're doing all of these wacky spots. And finally, Dude Love puts the mandible claw on. Owen comes off the top with the drop kick to break it up. The ref is getting rid of Owen. Austin gives Bulldog the stunner. Dude Love gets the pin, wins the match, and the titles. They're celebrating afterwards. As they're celebrating, Steve Austin gets... He grabs both belts. Mm -hmm. I fucking did this by myself. I'm the champion, myself. Two chicks get in the ring. Right. And I might add that 19 years later, I remember that brunette vividly. Yeah. And wasn't the, the blonde was his wife, correct? I think so. Yeah. But they get in the ring and they're partying with Dude Love and Stone Cold Steve Austin with the heart of stone. Mm. Sees Dude Love. He's won the match and he's got two chicks in the ring. Mm -hmm. And this is enough for Steve Austin to throw the belt at him and shake his hand. That's correct. That's what it took for Steve Austin to respect Dude Love. Now, last week on this show, I talked about how goddamn perfect this was. In the sense that it was not meant to be like this. Because 1997 was all about real life shit that happened that they made the best of. When they did those series of vignettes for Mankind, and because he's talking about his whole life... And he happens to have footage of him jumping off a fucking roof. They start talking about Dude Love. The Dude Love character that he always wanted to be. Well, lo and fucking behold, the tag team champions are Steve Austin and Shawn Michaels. And Shawn Michaels gets in a real-life backstage fight with Bret Hart, and he's out of here, maybe forever. Steve Austin has no partner. The fact that they had Dude Love... Waiting in the wings. Mankind wanting to be Shawn Michaels, and after all these years, he finally had the opportunity. It fell into place so perfectly that it's proof of God. <laughs> the next time that you tell Cameron a story from the Bible, I want you to tell him about this storyline. Okay. Now, the only thing that I didn't like about it, my only issue, mm -hmm. and it's really not their fault, I guess it sort of is, this match where Dude Love debuted took place in San Antonio. Right. And it took place on the show where Shawn Michaels came back. Correct. That kind of ruined the whole storyline. Because Shawn Michaels returns in his hometown. He's over like God, quite mm -hmm. frankly. And he pretty much lets the world know, I don't give a shit about these tag titles. He didn't fight hard for it. That's fair. Austin didn't want him to be his partner, but you know what? He could have come out. Just like Mankind came out as Dude Love. Mm -hmm. It would have been so much better if Shawn Michaels had not returned yet. And Mankind played the role of Shawn Michaels, came back and replaced him, and then they won the tag titles. And then Shawn could have come back the next week or whatever. 
that's my only nitpick with this whole thing. But man, what a what a storyline! <laughs> it's crazy. That's, it was awesome. One thing that I didn't get to mention because you, uh, well, you took over. As mankind was in the ring, making his big comeback, he still had his sunglasses on. He had his bandana on. He had his tie dye shirt on. Owen took over on offense by raking mankind's eyes. Let me reiterate. Mankind had his glasses on. I laughed and I laughed and I laughed. They were cheap glasses and it's possible they didn't have any glass in them. Apparently. They may have just been frames. Anyway, Mankind and the two girls danced and the show faded to black. And that was Monday Night Raw. That's right. Let's do unnecessary censorship. And you did so good, Craig, that you will do Nitro as well. Here we go. Building up this, and they show the footage of Steve Regal and Jimmy Garvin f***ing Wahoo. And they f***ing him, and Jimmy Garvin gets the strap, and he's f***ing Wahoo. Jimmy Garvin is so gently f***ing Wahoo McDaniel. Because he knows that when they f at some point, Wahoo is going to get a hold of that and he oh, yeah. is going to <laughs> Jimmy Garvin. That's true. And he knew going in, I'm going to be so nice when I this guy, I'm barely going to lay a hand on him. And he didn't give a shit if it looked good or not. He was looking out for himself. Good for him. <laughs> wow. I miss that angle. The sultry music made it. The sultry music in my sultry description made it. Okay. Raw, number 219 from July 21st, 1997. You were in Halifax, Nova Scotia. In the opening video, hyping up the Hart Foundation's feud against American wrestlers and the flag match they were going to have tonight. And if you watched this and you were not a student, if you were not in the U.S. or Canada at the time and didn't know anything about the history, you would think these two nations were, in fact, going to go to actual legitimate war mm -hmm. with bullets and bombs. I love that they buried Canada and the Canadian fans saying that Canadians loving Brett were just blind patriots. Yes. How dare you support this man? You have no good reason for it because he's a shithead. It's basically what they said. They're very proud people, Brian. And they interviewed a bunch of folks, including a fella missing teeth. Just to let us Americans know, these Canadians are toothless hicks <laughs> there like were, Bret Hart. There were four or five segments where they interviewed the fans. And uh, all I can say is I've, I've, I've known a few Canadians and these fans they interviewed were not the best Canada has to offer. <laughs> you don't say. No, that, I, I do say. Vader versus Ken Shamrock. Shamrock was still getting plenty of cheers from the Canadian fans. Of course, he was also wrestling another evil American. He did an inset promo vowing that to beat Vader tonight and also make the British Bulldog eat dog food at SummerSlam. Because mm. apparently the gimmick this year was every wrestler at SummerSlam, every match had to have one guy who vowed to do something if he lost. Well, yeah, in the U.S. versus Canada feud. If Brett lost, I'm never wrestling in the U.S. again. If Bulldog loses, I'll eat a can of dog food. If, if, Owen, if I lose to Owen Hart, I'll kiss his ass. Up and down the card, everyone had to push on the line. So I really enjoyed this match. Dude, the pay-per-view match was way better. I have seen the pay-per-view match. It is The pay-per-view match is maybe the most, most legitimately violent WWF match I ever saw. This was actually a fun match, but I didn't think Ken Shamrock looked very good here. I was thinking the same thing, actually. He's better than he should be, but he's still very green. If that makes a whole lot of sense. I think there was a point when he broke in and well, I guess, was this like, he's, he's had a few matches by now, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. His gimmick at first was he's the UFC guy in a WWE ring. So he totally stood out. He was totally different and that made him totally awesome. And I think now they've started to transition him into being a guy. He's still doing a lot of rolling knee bars. He's still doing leg kicks to the inner thigh that no one else does. He's still uh, throwing crazy suplexes around left and right, but he also is doing things like Hurricane Ronis. And they're, like I said, they're, he's in the transition mode. Well, that shit didn't work on Vader. He, he tried to Hurricane Ron on Vader, and Vader just caught him and threw him outside. So he, I hope he learned his lesson. The belly to belly that he hit him with sure did, though. Oh. I will, I will say that Shamrock the Shooter did the shittiest double leg attempt I've ever seen. It's Vader. Although, 
There was no sprawl. It was just as shitty when he did to Kimbo, and Kimbo fell down. <laughs> I so, really miss Kimbo. Everyone misses Kimbo. God damn it. I bet fights. Shamrock misses Kimbo. His fights were just amazing every time. <laughs> so when Shamrock got thrown outside, Bulldog ran down, power slammed him on the ramp, and uh, Shamrock eventually got countered out, his first loss in WWE. I enjoyed this match. It was very intense and still very non-formulaic. Usually the run and finish bothers me. This one made complete sense. Bulldog and him are feuding. He doesn't want to eat any dog food. And he handed Ken Shamrock his first loss. Yes. I did love that they had Paul Bear out there and he raked Ken's eyes and Ken goes outside and Paul Bear begging off. <laughs> so fucking great. It was funny. I can't believe he's not a cartoon. Paul Bear? Like, he's... He's a live-action cartoon character. Yeah. Yes, he was. It is funny with Shamrock, and we talked, I talked about this a second ago, but even, you know, he, he does not play to the crowd much, if at all. He's, he's in a fight. <laughs> he's, he's guards up all the time. And th their whole point about this is he's not used to this environment, so when they catch him outside and throw him into the stairs, that's new to him. You don't train for that when you're training for an octagon fight. And then, of course, when the manager comes over and whacks you with his shoe... <laughs> Very effective, because his guard was down. Didn't see that one coming. Brackus is coming. Brackus. No, he's not. Akeem Albrecht, he was a... He was German. He was a very famous bodybuilder that Vince took a liking to and thought, I will send this man to Bret Hart. Make him a wrestler. He was big. Being big is good. And Bret failed to make <laughs> this man into a wrestler. Yeah. Did he ever actually do a match? I think he did some dark matches, but I don't think he I know he was in Brawl TV for All. Match. He was in Brawl for All? I'm pretty sure he was in Brawl for All. No. Thank. Maybe I'm wrong. You gotta check. I can't believe that. I'll check shortly here. The Heart Foundation came out. Heroes welcome. All these people were so happy to see the hearts. Even Brett was like looking around and smiling like, wow, these people really like me. <laughs> He's really moved. So Brett says, all the Americans in the back are hiding. They're scared to accept my challenge. No one wants to come out and face us in a flag match. He called out the Undertaker by name. Says, Undertaker, we don't have to wait until SummerSlam. We can fight tonight. And Davy Boy says, Ken Shamrock, you're scared. We don't have to wait until SummerSlam. We can fight tonight. And Owen Hart, Owen Hart speaks up, says, Steve Austin's a pervert. I don't know why you want to kiss my butt, Austin, but I'm going to make you do it. And we don't have to wait until SummerSlam. We can fight tonight. And he added... Steve Austin, you will. He said, You will never kiss my butt, but you can suck my toes. What? I, <laughs> I think we were supposed to think he was going to say you could suck my dick, but they <laughs> swerved something. us. That's the best explanation I have. It'd swerve us. So Austin appears and he buries Canada. Or maybe he, the comedy was that he called him a pervert for wanting to kiss his ass, <laughs> but then he told him that he could suck his toes. Which is a little weird. Know what I mean? Yep. I have confirmed that Brockus was in Brawl for All. Yes, Brian, oh, I know what you God. mean. Oh, my God. I'd like to know who his opponent was. Please tell me. Savio Vega. Holy fuck, I can't wait till Brawl for All's on Raw. <laughs> I don't, when did that I blocked happen? all of it out of my mind. Well, that's good. By the way, we'll get it's to it in a moment. A long selection of bad fights where everyone got hurt. We'll get to it in a moment here. All right. They actually replayed the horrible Los Bariquas versus DOA brawl. I said, speaking of Savio. Can you imagine? They thought this was good. They thought this was worth showing on TV two weeks in a row. I guess so. It was shit. <laughs> it was bad, Vince. I, I trust you. I, I have little reason to doubt you. Brian Walsh versus Brian Christopher. Okay. <laughs> now listen. I know that we make fun of WWE and their decisions all the time, as we did tonight with the draft, but Brian Christopher, stay with me, everybody, as I describe this. Okay. Brian Christopher was the bad guy. Mm -hmm. Brian Walsh was supposed to be the good guy. Because he was from Canada. They were in Canada, so he came out with three little Canadian flags. All is going well. But then the announcer says, originally hailing from Canada, <laughs> but having moved to Rhode Island, 
Brian Walsh. And fucking everybody turned on him immediately. Is Rhode Island in Canada? Fuck no. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> what the fuck did they do that for? I don't know. They had the guy come no out. Explanation. They had him carry flags in Canada. Uh -huh. And then someone thought it would be a good idea to remind us that, hey, you know what? He was from Canada. But now he hails from Rhode Island. Why in the fuck would you do that? It's his big homecoming, Brian. Jesus Christ. They booed the guy out of the building. Well, you know. You I mean, you it sucked. You can't kayfabe a star like Brian Walsh. You know, you really can't. Everyone knew he's not living in Canada these days. Fucking he's A. The, he's the biggest star in Rhode Island. He may actually be the biggest star in Rhode right, Island. Yeah. I don't know. But uh, he, he looked... Like every 1980s Saturday Night Jobber, he looked like uh, the ball bearing was about to crush him. And he gets in there, this guy could go. This guy could go. You know, sometimes people get down on our website or me or whatever. It's kind of like <sighs> shit happens. Sometimes. Sometimes shit happens, okay? There's nothing I can do about it. Mm -hmm. This! <laughs> there is no explanation for why you would throw out that he now lives in Rhode Island if you want the guy to be a fucking baby face. Give me a break. Your points are valid, Brian. It sucked. Brian Christopher won with a top rope leg drop. I enjoyed this match and I want more Brian Walsh. Good luck. I don't expect more Brian Walsh. I bet you Brian Walsh could have had a heck of a match with Bobby Eaton. Oh, yeah. Yeah. 19 years ago, just like on Raw, they're doing a cruiserweight division. Yep. Boy, did it suck here. I hope it gets better than this. I hope so. Maybe they'll bring back Brian Walsh. Yeah. Maybe he relocated to fucking Canada. He re-relocated. Had a Truth Commission hype video. Ugh. I legit forgot these guys existed. Were they on the show at all last week? I missed last week. No. They, okay. They've been on... They've had some... They Commandant had came somewhere. out and cut that one promo. Yeah. And then nothing has happened in like six months. No. They weren't on last week. Not last week, but they've been on okay. before. Classic, hilarious, bullshit, goofy foreign heels. Pretty much. I liked it. We will show you Americans how inferior you are. Because there's not enough of that going around in this company right now. Especially today. Yeah. Eddie, do love video package. I am very, very sad I missed last week's episode with the do love debut. And I may actually go back and go watch it. Go back and it. watch it. Because I, I remember it vividly and how awesome it was. It was great. So this is mostly a recap of the Mankind sit-down interviews with Jim Ross. And then he had a Vince McMahon a voiceover who basically said that in an attempt to become Dude Love, Foley had actually become so scarred and so ugly that he couldn't be Dude Love until Dude was needed. <laughs> he showed up last week. And there was a line in here, which was a total throwaway line. And I know this team only did like two or three more matches anyway. But when he described the Dude Love Steve Austin tag team as the team of love and hate. That's awesome. That's the best name for a team ever. They need to be back teaming every week as the team of love and hate. Just leave Austin on the apron. He doesn't have to wrestle. It's almost as good as Hell No. Team Hell No was good too. So Vince goes on this huge Vincent Man speech. He has achieved not just Dude Love's dream, but every man's dream. And he earned Austin's respect and he won the tag titles. And he had Austin cut a promo saying he did not want a partner, but dude had proven he had what it took to get the job done. They showed the Godwins last week jumping the LOD, hitting Hawk with a reverse DDT on the ramp, and legit busting him open. Here's an idea. Stop doing moves on the ramp. The wrestling war, dude. And again, I'm sure whoever decided it's time to start taking bumps on the ramp was not one of the guys who was taking bumps on the ramp. At this time, the show ground to a screeching halt. I gotta talk about this here. LOD versus the Black Jacks versus the Godwins. It's actually much worse than that. In a number one <laughs> contenders three-way tornado <laughs> yeah, it was match. The headbangers, right? Not, take, you took the, take the Legion of Doom out, put the headbangers in. I'm sorry. That will make any match much worse. I'm sorry. I apologize. You were correct. Yes. Now, this is the Mandela effect. This is the Berenstain versus the Berenstain Bears. In the fucking universe I live in, the Godwins never wrestled after Henry broke his neck. That's correct. Now this motherfucker is the number one contender for the tag titles? Like, months later. You know what's funny? Is the very next segment is a Shawn Michaels interview. I remember word for word. And I have no memory of the return of Henry fucking Godwin. I refuse to believe it happened. That should tell you something, Brian. 
Yeah, it should I tell wish... me that the universe split, and I fucking ended up in this one where Henry Godwin kept wrestling. You got in the DeLorean and went back to the future. Something. All I know is I wish I could block this period of time from my life, because this match was unbelievably awful. It's the worst thing I saw all week. First of all, the Blackjacks show up, and they cut this very intentionally goofy-ass promo. Two rowdy cowboys, and oh. we're not the best wrestlers, but we're the toughest. Ha 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 ha. And the headbangers do a promo where I swear to God, their point was, we don't get a lot of sleep, and we smell bad, and then they giggled. One of them vomited water on the other. Yeah. <laughs> the other guy starts laughing, breaks character, because he got vomited on. Mosh does that. And they kept going. All the time. It's so weird. Fuck this. Were they supposed to be grunge fans? Who the Actually, fuck knows? Actually, it was post-grunge, because it was 97. So Manson, kind of the emo thing, but oh yeah, these two struck me as emo. Well, you know what I mean. No, they, I don't know what you they mean. They weren't grunge. They were post they were shit. Fair enough. They, they 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 were so much worse than I remember in every way. So the, the the rules of this match were: there's one guy from each team in the ring, and you can tag your partner. Can you imagine what a clusterfuck this would be? Now remember that the Godwins and the Headbangers were involved. This was like the worst battle royal I ever saw, and it wouldn't end, and no one would get eliminated because there was it, there was not enough room to, for us to do anything. There was no plan. They just pummeled each other for eight minutes, whatever it was. It all sucked. It never went anywhere. And after however long this this went, after these half dozen assholes just whacking each other randomly, the Headbangers fucked up their finish on purpose this time. And the Godwins won with a bucket shot. No good. Fucking horrible. No, 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 no good. Absolute mess. All right. From the bottom to the top. Let's talk about Sean. Please. <laughs> Sean Michaels had been the babyface star of the company since, I guess, since Sid powerbombed him after Mania 11, I believe. It's been a while. Yeah. yeah. He had been the top guy, and if you've ever seen any of his interviews or read his book, you know that his time on top as the top guy, especially after all his friends left, he hated it. He was a miserable person. And this was his first time in all those years to come out and not be a tweener, not show an edge. His job was to go out there and piss off the fans. So he comes out. He's not dressed to wrestle. He's not wearing jeans and his t-shirt to buy the merch to you know sell the merch stands. He is in pleated shorts, loafers, and a plaid flannel shirt, which was tucked into those shorts briefly until he removed it to dance. And he came out daintily skipping down to the ring. It was absolutely amazing. He had the flags up in the corners for the flag match later. He climbs up the top rope, salutes the American flag, does a huge backflip to land on his feet and prove that his knee is just fine. And keep in mind that later, they did the storyline where he got beat up because they were going to give him a little bit more time. Mm. Man, she is very, very crabby Brian's right now. Brian's baby's having a bad night. By the way, I'm getting some uh, uh, messages from our buddy Sean here. Mm. For, he got three of them. I've already lost interest with the draft after the second round. Too confusing. Although Finn Balor went to Raw, so that's cool. Expert review. I say thanks for the update, Sean. Yeah. So, Sean, I believe, unless I missed something, but I believe these were the first uh, crotch chops of his career in this promo. He also cut the entire thing just staring at himself on the monitor. Of course. It never gets old. And I, I always laugh at this. He starts telling jokes about fairies in the Canadian military. Six Canadian flags. Vince laughs. <laughs> Vince was ha, laughing. Ha, ha, fairies. <laughs> he sticks Canadian flags in his shorts, and the fans are calling him a very, very rude word. But he knows they weren't talking about him. He says, I'm going to be in that flag match. The fans say, we want Brett. We want Brett. And he says, you get him later. And he announces that uh, he, he's back. He wanted something to do with SummerSlam. And he went to, as he's put it, WWF officials. And he said this and then looked right at Vince. And he says, I want a job. And they said, all the jobs are taken unless you want to be a special ref. So I'm going to be a special ref at SummerSlam. And Ross asks, what match are you going to be in? And Sean says, there's the lower card, the mid card, the top card, and the main event, and I only work the main event. So I will be the special referee for the Bret Hart Undertaker title match. 
And per the orders of WWF officials, looks at Vince again, if I do not call this match down the middle, I will be banned from wrestling in the U.S., and that means I have to move up here to Canada. Then he skipped around the ring, waving Canadian flags again. Shawn Michaels was great. He was having the time of his life <laughs> yes. trolling these Canadians. Yes. Now, I do have a question. So, maybe I didn't think about this back then, but the storyline is that he hates Brett. Brett is going to have a match with The Undertaker for the title. And if Brett does not win the title, he must never wrestle in this country again. Correct. Correct. Shawn Michaels is going to be the referee. But it's made abundantly clear that if Shawn does not call it down the middle, he will also be banished. Mm-hmm. Right. Why would he want this job? That's a good question. I never thought about it before, but as I was watching it here, it was like, so you have to count the pin when Brett wins the title. Yeah. You can't fuck with the guy. Those are the rules. Why would you want this job? There should be like a punishment for a heel. Perhaps, right? perhaps I, I don't think I ever actually saw that match. Uh, perhaps he had a cunning plan that went awry. No. No? He did not have a cunning plan that went awry. There was no secret plan? No. Yeah. I'll tell you what, when he announced this, this crowd lost their ever-loving yeah, minds. They, 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 didn't, they did not trust Sean. This crowd was absolutely amazing. All night. That's true. Hunter Hearst Helmsley versus the Patriots. <laughs> the Patriots backstage. <laughs> and he cuts a promo. And he says, I am a Patriot. And I respect the flag of all nations. However... I'm disappointed in you fucking Canadians for liking this Bret Hart. <laughs> that's what he said, not, Brian. Not, not a quote. <laughs> not his exact words, but that's essentially what he said. <laughs> it would have been better. <laughs> now, please tell me, by the way, that the Patriot debuted last week. Yes. Yeah. Because this was, oh, man. <laughs> just, there's just a masked guy. No, he was there last week. Okay. And they introduced him last week as the Patriot Del Wilkes. Oh, did they? Yeah. In a mask? It's like, yeah. Superman Clark Kent is going to be our guest today. <laughs> So he comes out here in the ugliest star-spangled gear I think I've ever seen. I did not realize black was such a prominent part of the American flag. He wrestled for like a minute until the hearts come out, and they bypass the match entirely. They just want to yell at Vince for making Sean the referee in Brett's title match. Brett screams at Vince, you're swerving me. Just wait, dude. It's crazy. Just wait. (laughs) Did you notice as Brett is yelling at Vince... Ross just happens to be holding a handheld microphone pointed at Brett. Oh, the yeah. Whole time. It was amazing. <laughs> Dude, Jim Ross was so awesome on commentary yes, as he was. this insanity is ensuing. Yes. Like, he was freaking the fuck out. I like the guys today that would just kind of call the Oh, action. my. Oh, my. There's a fight breaking out. So, yeah, Brett and Vince grab each other by the shirt collar, and really it was just that and shoving back and forth. But yeah, Jim Ross is begging them stop it, guys. <laughs> Control yourselves. And eventually, they were separated. The match was thrown out. Patriot jumped Brett. The hearts kicked his ass. And chaos reigned and they went to break. My favorite part was the very last scene that we see is Shawn Michaels, real life best friend in the company, Triple H, teaming up with Bret Hart to stomp a hole in the fucking Patriot. Yeah. I laughed at that. So they come back. The announcers are still disheveled. They were able to throw it to Paul Bearer for a backstage promo. Here's another one that I totally blocked out of my mind. So they had promised that Paul Bearer would reveal proof of Kane this week. Right. Proof that Kane was alive. Yeah, and I was like, I don't remember this. What the fuck was it? Now I know why I didn't remember. It right? sucked. <laughs> the payoff was nothing. The payoff was when they were young brothers, Kane and The Undertaker had together built a statue of the Grim Reaper. And then to... Uh, As children do. Well, the children of morticians, maybe. Sure. So, I mean, the Grim Reaper indirectly puts food on their table. That's very so, true. Yeah, they I owe, hadn't thought of that, Vince. They owe him a favor. Anyway, for some reason, I was not clear on this. They determined to cut the statue in half. Sure. And so no matter where they would go... With, as it's like a travels, promise ring. Sort of. You take this half. I'll take this. Or what is it, those little necklaces? Yeah. yeah, yeah. I never a had pendant. one, but... Yeah. One hand, it's like a heart, it's broken in half. And yeah, you, you put take it, one, yeah. It's like when uh, Lay Cool had the women's belt. Very much so. Yeah. So, anyway, 
They said, well, we'll always have half of the statue wherever we go. And he said, I have Kane's half of the statue. And he pulled out a charred, melted, scorched lump of plastic. Mm -hmm. Here it is. This proves Kane is alive. Sweet proof, Paul. Or did Kane actually die in a fire? And they just found the thing. See, this is why it's bad proof. And, you know, and yeah, I, I forget what they said. But he is a heel. Jim Ross did say, you have failed to prove Kane is alive. Yeah, he said, we want to see him. And then Paul says, you don't want to see Kane. Don't make me do it. Because I will. I will reveal Kane. He was awesome here. Paul's always great. Farouk versus Goldust. This goddamn match. We had another. First of all, there was a Goldust instant promo because there is another stip match at SummerSlam. If Brian Pillman loses, he must wear a dress. Why wasn't that Walsh fella out here during this? Because no one gave a shit about the match because stuff was going down backstage. Yeah. <laughs> Vince is is he's calmed down, but he is still sternly repeating that Sean. If Sean is a biased referee, he will be banned from wrestling in the U.S. Maybe Brett didn't hear that part. He says. And then a second goes by. <laughs> I felt so much like Vince. I felt for him. As Vince is just calmly saying, clearly he wasn't listening. <laughs> clearly he didn't hear what I said. So, Otherwise he wouldn't be behaving like this. Yes, I can't believe Brett would ever react this way. And he pauses and he just says, oh no. And he takes off his headset and he leaves. <laughs> Part of me hoped he was just watching this match and just says, oh no. And he took off his headset and left. But no, I was playing the storyline. So apparently, Jim Ross explained, the hearts had been seen leaving Shawn Michaels' locker room and Shawn was injured again. They had a very, very boring match. <laughs> Can I talk about this finish? They're having this fucking hideous match. And Kama interferes. Oh, God, I forgot about this until now. Yeah. But Molina has taken the ref. So yeah. the ref is not watching Kama. But Jim Ross, for some reason, I don't know if he was in a weird position or what, but he cannot, for the life of him, figure out why the ref isn't calling for a disqualification because Kama is fucking around. But on the other hand, the ref was looking right at the melee on the outside. Well, the point of this is, the ref finally DQs Farouk for Kama's interference. Like, I swear to God, three minutes after it happened. Yes! Well, and Jim Ross just goes, what the hell is going on? Yes. <laughs> That's exactly what he said. He was well, disgusted. His other line was, you took your sweet time because, as you noted, he called for the DQ three minutes after the interference. That's not totally accurate. He called for the DQ three minutes after the interference started. And for the next three minutes, Kama beat up Goldust on the floor. And then he threw him in, Farouk hit the Dominator, and then the ref called for the DQ. He let the attack go on forever. Goldust could have been killed by Kama, the Supreme Fighting Machine here. What was amazing was this absolutely just totally sucked, but it was compelling. It was? Because it was just such a fucking live disaster. I guess. Vince leaving, a shitty match, <laughs> bullshit happening at the finish, Jim Ross swearing at how bullshit this was. <laughs> I enjoyed it. Wow. I didn't. I'm looking for anything real nowadays. I see. Everything is so scripted on Raw in 2016. Just give me some craziness. Geeks were tending to Sean backstage. Vince showed up. Sean yelled at him, said, what kind of zoo are you running? Christ, yes, I'm hurt. That was the last we saw of him in the show. <laughs> This was a recap of what really happened. It pretty basically was. Yeah, it was the, the Shawn Michaels Bret Hart real life fight. They turned into an angle. Yeah. So it's time for the flag match. Bret and Owen Hart and Davy Boy Smith versus Steve Austin and two mystery partners. By the way, where was Pillman tonight? Dude, he was at the end of the show. He was at the end of the show. Yeah. He was hiding under the ring the whole fucking night. Did you stop watching? No, no. I, I know he was at the end of the show, yeah. but where was he up until now? Hiding under Maybe the ring. Maybe legit under the ring. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Dude, so, back in the day, people would be under the ring for hours, mm -hmm. and and that was that was the uh, one of the the ribs guys would pull is if you knew someone was under the ring for hours and couldn't leave, you do something terribly rude down there, so they had to sit in the stench. I see. Yeah. So, Dude Love came out to be Austin's mystery partner, and the match began. First, they played the Canadian anthem. All the fans sang along. So did Brett. Brett all, <laughs> in the ring singing the anthem. All, all, all Canadians always sing with the anthem. Because it's a good song and easy to sing. Yeah, right after Oh Canada, I get lost. I... Well, you're not Canadian. That's right. Americans do not sing the Star Spangled Banner because it's very hard to sing and most of them can't do it and it sounds awful. And they put their hand over their heart. Yeah. Because they confuse it with the Pledge of Allegiance. Also right. true. Also true. So they're doing this quick brawl and the idea is we'll do a brawl. 
And uh, we'll go to commercial. Right before the commercial, we'll have Undertaker come out to be the third man. And they timed it so horribly that they announce the break, the camera starts to fade away, and then you hear a very faint, Bong. and that was Taker's cue to come out. So they came back. It was a standard six-man, and Taker was there on the apron. Can you make that noise again, please? I don't know if I can, actually. <laughs> Bong. Please recreate that dong. It's the best I could do. So Taker was the American dead man, but he still got a mixed reaction when he tagged in. So Owen Hart was a heel for pretty much all of his career. <laughs> this was so weird. <laughs> the heat on Owen. Owen as babyface in peril was awesome. Mm -hmm. Shouldn't be surprised. It's Owen. And the Americans, meanwhile, were double teaming him, low blowing him, mocking him when he was down. Complete pricks. About 10 minutes, they worked him over. Finally, they did maybe the funniest, in a good way, hot tag I ever saw. Owen dives to the corner, but Austin catches him like in an atomic drop position. But he's still so close to the corner, Owen, from the shoulders, can reach down and tag Brett. So Brett's legal, but Austin slams Owen down, thrusts his fist in the air, and then turns around and Brett Hart clotheslines him. I laughed and I laughed and I laughed. Broke down into a six-way. Great brawl, places going nuts, and it all builds up to after a long time in this match. This was close to 20 minutes. At the very end, it built up to a short showdown between Brett and The Undertaker in the one on one preview of the SummerSlam main event. Great booking here. And Taker and Brett were finally racing to grab their respective flags when Brian Pillman, who was there, mm -hmm. he ran out from under the ring to attack The Undertaker, and this let Brett grab the Canadian flag and win. It's a huge pop for the Canadians. They left through the crowd to celebrate with their people. Austin was left seething in the ring. That was one hell of a TV show, all in all. I very much enjoyed it. And yeah, that's where Pillman was. Yes, thank you. Under the ring. The whole time. Yeah. It was a great, great show. I loved every minute of this. I did love when JR was like, where could Pillman have come from here in this building with 9,000 crazy Canadians? He hid. It wasn't Pillman from Pittsburgh? Doesn't matter. Cincinnati. He has a heart. Oh, yeah, that's right. He's a heart he had, at heart. He had trained in Calgary. Okay. I believe we actually have a song. Oh. I haven't had a lot of these in a while, but if you want to send them MP3 format, Brian at WrestlingObserver.com. Song in the subject line is from Chuck. I guess you motherfuckers know who I am. Representing New York. Money, power, respect, and bitches. Right. The new block. The new block. Man on the street. Yes, they represented Brooklyn or something or something. Okay. One of them said he was murder one. He didn't give a fuck about nothing except the money. Two other guys. Yes. The dirty rotten scoundrels. That's true. They promised to get high. They promised to get high. They promised to get high and fuck somebody up. Big Block was in the studio. Yes. The gloves were off. Holy shit. He cuts a promo. And you know what? He cursed a lot. Two other men meeting in a car. A car they exchanged money. Like so out comes Melly Mel. With a honey. <laughs> diamonds, diamonds, rubies, <laughs> and jacuzzi. Same bullshit. Diamonds, diamonds, rubies, <laughs> and jacuzzi. Keep going. Diamonds, diamonds, rubies, <laughs> and jacuzzi. Oh, yeah. Diamonds, diamonds, rubies, <laughs> and jacuzzi. <laughs> Amazing work. <laughs> the awesome. UWF songs are always the best. And they involve us rapping. I'm looking at the Brawl for All bracket. What could right be now. whiter? <laughs> Not nothing. Absolutely nothing. First of all, we're still a year away from Brawl for All. That makes me sad. Second of all, do you realize uh, uh, Henry Godwin? No, was... because I blocked all of his comeback out of my fucking <laughs> Henry mind. Henry Godwin told you was this. in Brawl for All. Uh, I've got a broken neck. Here's an idea. I'll enter a boxing tournament. That's a terrible idea. Honestly, I swear to God, when I was a kid, this didn't happen. It's new. This would explain a lot of my memory issues from that time in my life. I took no drugs. When did we start wrestling? 98. Okay. After this. Okay. Well, I mean, I was before this. It wasn't... It's not... It's not that. Okay. I remember Shawn Michaels' promo word for word. I just don't remember Henry fucking Godwin. I remember the headbangers. I had forgotten. They I, existed. I remember timeline. I remember they existed. I do not remember just how miserably bad they were. Let's start with Raw. Retro Raw number 220, July 28th, 1997. Heart Foundation came out for a promo. 
Jim Ross explains, he's doing the interview, and he says, I was in a disciplinary meeting with Bret Hart this morning. And as he's speaking, Bret shoots a look at Vince, and the camera cuts to Vince, who is standing there looking outrageously uncomfortable, looking down at his notes and avoiding eye contact. And he said, next week, Gorilla Monsoon is going to name a new commissioner. Oh, what an because irony. here we are two decades later. I hope it's Stephanie McMahon. <laughs> it might be. <laughs> I've forgotten who it was. It's, it's got to be Steph. It's all still GMs and commissioners and presidents, and it's all about the people in power. Yeah, but you know what? Let me, let me bring something up here. You're right. It is all about the people in power. But later on in the show, Gorilla Monsoon comes out, and he further explains that next week he's going to have a new commissioner out there. And essentially what he says is that I can't do it all and we need somebody who's going to take care of the fans. And in fact, he said at the beginning of the show, he said we were thinking of getting rid of Bret Hart, finding him and maybe even firing him. But we thought it was in the best interest of the fans to allow them to see this match at SummerSlam. Because back then, the authority figure was all about the fans. Unlike today, when they hate the fans. And that's the storyline. It has been for years. So, the interview continues. Brett says, Americans will do anything to screw you. And he shoots a look at Vince McMahon. Just you wait. It's crazy. <laughs> it is amazing how this all played out. It was, it was comical to me, because when he said that, it's amazing how Americans will screw you. And the camera focused in on Vince's face for like a four Mississippi. Yeah. <laughs> It's like, wow, foreshadowing. Indeed, indeed. So Brett said when he promised to never wrestle again in the U.S. if he lost to Undertaker, he didn't mean it in a literal sense. He's going on and complaining about how the deck is stacked against him and Shawn Michaels with the ref. And it occurs to me, I, we may have talked about this lately, but very underrated part of Bret Hart at this time, those mirrored sunglasses he had. The way that it's reflected the world right back at you. Yeah, you couldn't see his eyes. You couldn't see his eyes. It was, it was very important. It was. I'll talk more about Brett later, but I do love that he is a heel who made a very, very cocky statement. Then he got called on it, and now it's everyone else's fault. Exactly. He didn't mean it. No. When he said if he lost, he'd leave. I wouldn't say anything that absurd. No. He was just kidding. <laughs> and now they're holding him to it. These fuckers. Yes. How dare they? So there's kind of a famous promo because they're in Pittsburgh. And Brett had his line about how if you were giving the U.S. an enema, you would stick the hose right here in Pittsburgh because they're the pits. That's right. And this line he later determined was so offensive, he actually apologized for this. That one. <laughs> well, it's funny because the line everybody remembers is the one about sticking the hose in Pittsburgh. But they never air the follow which, up, which is, you know why? Because you're the pits. Yeah. <laughs> that part got edited out. It's too bad. In, 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 in That's classic stories. Brett, like when he calls a man a big, stupid dummy. That's right. <laughs> he made a great, he, he had a great barrel of Pittsburgh, but then followed it up with, because you're the pits. So he starts running down the Patriot and challenges him to a match tonight, and that was that. I liked it. It was fun. I like Brett Hart. The announcers are getting settled afterwards, and Jerry Lawler says, you better watch your mouth, Vince, or Brett's going to punch you out. <laughs> this is crazy. Again, foreshadowing. <laughs> All astonishing to watch. So I mentioned last week when they were, I believe they were in Halifax, and I said these fans were not the best fans Canada had to offer. Tonight they countered with not the best fans the U.S. had to offer. Now, are we sure that these aren't the best fans that the U.S. has to offer? Yes. Okay. They were, they, I've been to a lot of shows. They were in the same state as they were Monday, and Monday's crowd was pretty good. I, I won't say what they were the worst fans the U.S. had to offer either, but yeah. My entire recap of this was LOL. <laughs> That's it. What more is there to say? Los Bariquas versus Legion of Doom. God. I know what you're talking about. It fucking sucked. Yeah. Hawk sold. LOD comeback. Bariquas run in for the DQ. How many fucking DQs have we seen between two shows A thousand. on this particular Monday? Ra Ra had even more. Jesus Christ. And then they laid out Hawk and they slopped him. Yeah. And I hearken back to what Craig said many weeks ago <laughs> about how sad it was that the great road warriors were feuding with hog farmers. Now getting slopped on top of that. Yeah. By the way, is Miguel Perez the hairiest wrestler ever? High on the list. 
Is he hairier than George Steele? Oh, yeah. Okay. Hmm. Yeah, he's way, 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 way. Dutch Mantel, actually, I think Dutch is hairier. Uh, yeah, yeah. Anyway, yeah, the match was uh, very bad. It was a, it, it was three minutes of two guys taking turns doing moves and not selling anything. This is the fastest Road Warriors match of all time and not the best. I did like, by the way, the Puerto Ricans inset promo, which was all Savio Vega talking. We're going to be the LOD tonight. We're going to beat the DOE at Summer Slime. Then when he's finally wrapped Summer wrapped, Slime? Summer Slam. That's almost as good as the Summer Slam. The Summer Slam. He's finally done. And at the same time, they all go, ah, and they give a big group thumbs up. They barked. Mm. It was great. Anyway, yeah, the match sucked. Great, you say. That tells you how bad the match was. That that was great. The, the four men doing a thumbs up was vastly superior to the four men doing a match. Up until the main event, not a lot on this show hit. Dude, this I, when Brian said this was a fun show, I don't I, I don't know what he's talking about. <laughs> Hunter did a backstage promo hyping a steel cage match against Mankind at SummerSlam. Come on, he called Vader fat. How could it not be entertaining? He said it's not Vader time, it's Jenny Craig time. Yeah, who was writing this shit? These were fucking terrible lines. This is why they had to go hire 20 people. <laughs> he also said he couldn't believe Mankind would complain about beating up by a... a he couldn't believe Mankind would complain about getting beaten up by a woman like China. And only China only got involved after he had taken care of business. So he's supposed to have Triple H versus Vader. As China is having a stare down with Vader in the aisle. Can someone explain to me why before this match, when they put up the graphic for this match, Vince said something to the effect of, believe it or not, Triple H will be facing Vader tonight. Mm. I was like, why should I not believe this? Foreshadowing. Believe it or not. They had done, uh, as Vince likes to call them, tough man contest before, but it was still unusual to have two heels facing each other for no reason. Oh, I see. That's, two heels. That's my best explanation. Uh. So Mankind comes through. He is a disguised as a cameraman. He attacks Hunter. Horrible disguise. It was just a blue sweatsuit and the man kind of mask. <laughs> it's like, do all the, all right. All, all the cameramen are 280 pounds and wearing leather masks. So uh, China was. Keep in a, mind, he's got around without the mask because dude love. Yeah. Yeah. So why didn't he just hide his hair back and try <laughs> and blend in? Because Hunter is not feuding with mankind. So you don't blend in with that mask. No, you don't. So China double legs mankind. They double team him for a while. And finally, he fights them off. There is a long, long crowd brawl. Dude, let's not gloss over this. Foley is beating the hell out of Hunter. And China takes him out with a double leg. Mm -hmm. She's shooting on the man. They go to double team Foley. And China goes up to the top rope. I don't even know why. Here we go. But Foley tosses Hunter into the ropes. And China crotches the ropes and sells her balls. Here we go. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Why is everyone saying, here we go? That's exactly what happened. Because it is, because some, this is one of your pet peeves. For some reason, you believe that when women crotch something, they can't hurt their vajayjay. I didn't say they can't hurt it, but she sold her balls. That's what she did in this segment right here. What you cannot tell me was not by design, because the gimmick was, she was a woman that was built like a man. So at least in this sense, it made sense. Because maybe she didn't have balls. Right? Commandant got a promo backstage, hyping out the Truth Commission's debut. Wow. Did you even mention Michael Moore in the front row? I'm about to. How about Brackus? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Boxing champion Michael Moore was at ringside. Brackus growled in German for, a while, German for a while. He's speaking the whole thing in German. He calls out one group of people he wants to target. And they bring in an ang angry German. Who does he call out? The Nation of Domination. Way to go, guys. Way to make that uncomfortable. Brackus. Yeah. Real Double J and Flash Funk and Spark Plug Holly versus the Truth Commission. It's like they had three rocks and they threw them into the locker room and whoever they hit, those were the that was the team. I thought when you said they had three rocks, you were talking about the like charisma. Dwayne Johnson. <laughs> no. Flash Funk, no, Bob no, Holly, no, and no. Jesse James. Or the Truth Commission. Hot as hell, this heel team right <laughs> oh, here. Yeah. So the Truth Commission was Kurgan. Bull Buchanan and Rambo from the Catch Wrestling Association. Recon. Recon, as they called him here. Bull Buchanan was a sniper. This Recon they, had been around for like 15 years here. Sure. And <laughs> I don't know. They were competent. He was the best of the three. But yeah. There were moments where I wasn't sure he knew it was fake. Oh, sure. <laughs> 
Yeah, so they took a, uh, an American, a Canadian, and uh, I don't know where Rambo's from, actually. But uh, anyway, they took these guys together and said, you're now South African. Sure. The shield, this wasn't. Let me tell you something, though. At the time, Kurgan was fucking horrible. After watching Braun Strowman on Raw, who couldn't even successfully complete a squash match and look better than The Warlord in 1985. Kurgan looked fucking great. This was a perfectly competent big man. He was there and never fell down. No, he never fell down. He executed moves properly. He made sure to have a scary face on at all times. He was very ugly. That's <laughs> well, yeah. Anyway, they had a short sloppy match and he pinned Holly with a side slam. Yeah. Pinned him. The Commandante was an actor who then got into wrestling for a while. Why you would why you would be an actor and then go to Memphis to be a manager? It's beyond me, but that was his idea. Well, it worked for a comedian. At the very end of his career, Kurgan... As I say, this acting career must have been really hot. Yeah. Kurgan was a bad wrestler who became an actor and actually true. appeared in far bigger films than The Commandante, including 300 and Pacific Rim. Pacific Rim, that's right. Yeah. Recon and, was and Sherlock Holmes. Bull Buchanan and the sniper was Rambo. Mm-hmm. Vince made a phone call to give away a trip to SummerSlam. <laughs> this fucking kid. He was great. <laughs> That's the point. They called two guys. Yeah. One of them, I believed, really got a call from Vince McMahon because he was so goddamn happy. Yep. He was stumbling all over himself. This kid's like, hey, Vince, what's up? Yeah. <laughs> oh, you want a trip to SummerSlam? Cool. Hey, can I bring some people? Sure. How many can hey, I bring? Hey, how many can I bring? <laughs> that just one's fine. All right. Can I say hi to Jerry? This kid was a better caller than anybody in Observer Live. <laughs> and we actually have callers that I like on that show. There's no way this was not a child actor. It's impossible. I wrote down... Let me go here. Uh, Vince called an obvious plant. <laughs> That's what I said. Had a Patriot video package. This kid had more charisma than all of their backstage interviewers today put together. He had more, charisma, Renee. He had more charisma than the Truth Commission. He had more charisma than half of their announcing team today. Yeah. Had a Patriot video package. The point of which was to show that he got beat up last week. Dude, we need this Patriot back today. Number one, because of the state this country is in. Mm. And number two, this fucking guy was hilarious. The only thing missing from his promo were the words golly or gee whiz. Am I wrong? He's he is from South Carolina. He's very southern. He's the whitest meat, white meat baby face ever. He had like last week he was putting over Canada. Yeah. Even though everybody hated Canada, the mm -hmm. Patriot was a man who respected the flag of every country. But he's mad at Brett. Here he says. Brett had challenged him to a match. First of all, he would never turn down a chance to defend his country. And he says, my name is Del Wilkes, and I don't like Brett Hart, and I'll take pleasure in beating him up. Why did he give his real name? Dude, we talked about that last week. It, and that was two weeks And ago. wait till we get to Sean. Can we just jump to the chase here? If you want to. Sean Michaels comes out to do commentary oh, for right. the main event. It's Brett Hart versus the Patriot. And Jim Ross is talking about the Patriots' football background. And Sean Michaels says, J.R., how do you know he's got a football background? He has a mask on. And Jim Ross says, his name's Del Wilkes. Sean says, why the fuck's he wearing a mask then? Yes. Which is the same Sean, fucking question I have. The voice of reason. Yes. Sean, the 1997 version of Shawn Michaels. I guess because you can't paint a big American eagle on your face. I guess. God. If Jim Ross had so just said stupid. marketing. I guess. So we can sell masks. So I guess maybe The Undertaker will come out and say, my name is Mark. I'm sure they sold a shitload of Patriot masks back in the day. They I don't even have. think they even marketed them. Crush versus Farouk. Oh, fuck. <laughs> you I, like the show. I, you said you like the show. You know what? Maybe I was wrong. <laughs> I fell asleep not once, but twice watching this match. Okay, here's all you need to it know It wasn't that long. This. I know. This is all you need to know. Geeks ran in for the DQ. That's number one. At the end of the match, Los Bariquas run down. How many men are in Los Bariquas? Four. Four? Okay. So the Bariquas all grab Crush. Yes. Okay? And they're going to lift him up and slam him. Powerbomb. Four fucking men. 
are going to lift him up and slam him. God bless Crush. He had to jump. Mm -hmm. And of course, he mistimed it. So they fuck the whole thing up and then drop him right on his head on the cement here, on the, the, the ramp. It's baffling, yes. The only He's thing... so much worse than Kurgan. <laughs> the only thing I can say about this is you hear about all these matches. They wrestle for three minutes. There was a DQ and a brawl afterwards. And it sounds awful and repetitive and redundant, and it was. But I will say... The WWF crowds in 1997, every time there's a big brawl, everyone jumped to their feet. It's very true. They were totally into the chaos, even though it was dumb. Because you know what? That's cool occasionally. Yes. You don't do it three fucking times on every show. A year, when they have been doing this three fucking times on every show for a few years, they no longer jump to their feet every time. By the way, speaking about how bad Crush is... In all of his matches that I can remember, he did a pile driver. Yeah, and it was always terrible. He always like went to one side and mm -hmm. put his hand out to brace himself. Yes. How did he never kill anybody? Well, because then he went down to the side too. Yeah. Oh, jeez. That's okay. For once in my well, life, I dropping your head for agents. Wow. All right. Hmm. Somebody to tell this man to quit doing that move. Every match I ever remember him in. Godwins versus the team of love and hate. Yeah. The Godwins versus Steve Austin and Dude Love. Yeah. For the tag team titles. I can't believe... Have I mentioned before, I can't believe they're still wrestling after yeah. he broke his neck? Yeah. I don't remember any of this. Why would you? <laughs> well, I'll tell you why. Because I will, I will not soon forget the amazing comeback that Steve Austin oh. performed in this match. It's beautiful. Steve Austin, first of all, the reaction when he came out was insane. Then he made his great comeback where he was... Clothesline everyone, slamming every farmer he saw. He stuns Phineas. And Henry knocks him out of the ring. Owen clonks Austin with the European belt, and Steve Austin gets counted out so the Godwins can win. The Godwins <laughs> beat Steve Austin and Dude Love. Now, obviously, they did this because Austin was beating Owen on Sunday. Mm -hmm. But still, come on. Hog <laughs> Farmers beat Steve Austin. <laughs> Had to be a better way to do this. Give me a break. And then you'll never guess what happened. A giant brawl broke out. Mm -hmm. Austin, dude, the hearts, the god was a legion of doom. I went back and checked at this point. The only match that had not ended in a DQ and or post-match brawl was the Truth Commission. Owen Hart was spectacular on commentary, by the way. Bulldog was funny, too, actually. Owen more so. I don't know why I like this show so far. <laughs> I think it's because there's more to come at the end. There might be. Ken Shamrock came out carrying a table. The Bulldog had challenged him to an arm wrestling contest, and Shamrock is going to accept. Ace Darling versus <laughs> Devin Storm. <laughs> Devin Storm's in the ring, and he's jumping, and he's almost doing split jumps like Randy Orton. He's so fucking excited, and Vince McMahon on commentary calls him on it. Mm -hmm. He's clearly the more excited of the two. They do one million moves in 45 seconds. Right. <laughs> And then Devin won, and then he did the biggest celebration ever. It was like a man who dreamed his entire life that he was going to someday be in WWE. And he finally has one match on Raw, and he knows he'll never be back. And so he had to make every... He had to make the most of it. And he sure did! Didn't he end up getting signed to WCW? Yeah, was, Crowbar. That's right. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the two comments I have here were, one, the last time we saw Devin Storm, he was moving one million miles an hour in a match with Conan on Nitro. And two, he gets his giant win, clearly the biggest moment of his life. And Mr. Man's entire commentary is, boy, that was a quick matchup. <laughs> what the fuck else was he going to say? He didn't know any of the moves, that's for sure. No. I didn't know any of the moves. <laughs> they called a sunset flip. And well, I knew scissors. that one. They called someone else up and tried to give away another trip. First, they got a message saying the call cannot be completed. They tried two or three more times. They finally got this done. Can you believe... <laughs> 20 years after this, they would try this again and actually give away real money and make it the focus of the show. Then we had what I'm pretty sure was honestly the best thing in the show. Ken Shamrock and British Bulldog in an arm wrestling contest. This was, this was very good. This was awesome. They did not mess around. I figured they would do the bit where the heel backs away several times. He wants to switch. Use left arm. No, the right arm. Right arm. No, they went right into the arm wrestling match. 
and they had a fantastic work arm wrestling match. And Shamrock's got his whole body turned so his face is right in the camera and he's screaming and groaning as he's just about to lose to Bulldog here. And he starts to make his comeback and the crowd's going nuts and they're chanting. And just as Shamrock passes the halfway point, Bulldog drops him with a headbutt. What a dick. And he whacks him with a chair repeatedly and pours dog food all over him. And Shamrock was so great selling and rolling around in the dog food, just getting it everywhere. Ken Shamrock, the best performer on the show so far. No joke. You know, this is the oldest of old school angles, and it still was awesome. The stuff never gets old. It's kind of like today, you see the, they're going to do a contract signing. And of course, when the contract signing begins, they flat out tell you, you know these always end. Yes. With a brawl. And it's like, we know that, but like, don't tell us. If it's good, do it. Yeah, somebody's going through the table. If you got a better idea, then do the better idea. But this was great. It was so simple, but it was great. Goldust and Marlena came out for a promo. Had a mannequin out there in a dress. Goldust said, this is the dress Brian Pillman will be wearing after SummerSlam. And then Marlena and her pokey nipples said, Pillman didn't fill out his tights very well. Maybe he'll be a better fit in this dress. Don't tell me you didn't notice. How can you not? This led to Goldust versus Rockabilly. This is still going on. Ah, this, this is like, like you and Henry Godwin. I thought Rockabilly showed up like twice and they gave up. No, it's been three or four months now. They won't give up. So Rockabilly goes outside. He decides now would be a good time to slap Michael Moore. And so Michael Moore knocked him out. Meanwhile, Pillman attacks Goldust, beats him over the mannequin. Marlena jumping on his back was the biggest reaction of the whole segment. And Geeks pulled Pillman to the back and that was it. You know, the only thing I didn't like about this was it was the exact same angle as the previous segment. Yeah. Man comes out, beats a guy up, and then the gimmick for the pay-per-view is accomplished on the good guy. You're right. The show is repetitive and redundant. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I didn't like that. I didn't. <laughs> Undertaker, Bret Hype video. I think this was where I decided that I liked the show. The, the final 20 minutes or so... I thought it was so good that it rehabilitated the entire show. It's possible. Which is actually the story of the 90s. All of those shows where WCW had an awesome undercard, and then they had the goddamn worst main event, and so when the show was over, you thought it sucked. Mm -hmm. But then WWE or WWF had these shitty, shitty undercards, but then they have a great main event segment, and you'd go away going, man, I got my money's worth. That's how I felt on this show. So this hype video, it was clips of Brett, Sean, and Bulldog, and it's kind of amazing because for the past few months, Undertaker has been the dead man who is reuniting with his old manager who it turns out had worked with his father and his parents died in a fire and there's this long lost missing brother and it's all total fantasy stuff. And here they are talking about Undertaker, the athlete and the competitor. How big he is, how agile he is, how strong he is, how tough he is, how he's great at keeping focus, how he gets inside your head. And then even Taker speaks and he's... I wouldn't say out of character, but he's dialed down to a two or three. He says the most important thing in this business is making sure you have your mindset right. And no matter what distractions are going on outside the ring, you have to keep your focus on the match itself. So that was crazy. Yeah, it was like all this this whole time they built him up as a cartoon character, and then all of a sudden he comes on the screen and they humanize him. Yes. Cool. Hey, you can have two different storylines, you know what I mean? And Brett is awesome doing these things. Brett is fantastic in this kind of thing. I actually think that if you would have had, if you would have said, Brett, I know this is stupid, but this is the storyline with Undertaker and his burnt down house and his fucking brother. And we want you to go in and cut a very, very serious promo about this situation. I'll bet you anything you could have done it. But only Brett. (laughs) Only Brett. (laughs) Nobody else could have pulled this off. There is an authenticity that Brett Hart had that almost no one else ever had. I shall talk about that in a moment. Shawn Michaels came out for a promo. Still doing the pleated shorts and the loafers. He says he never apologized to anyone for anything. He knew he was safer in the ring or out here, I guess, than in the back. So he was going to take Vince's seat and do commentary for Brett's match tonight. We had Brett Hart versus the Patriot. I like as Brett's coming out, they cut to Sean, and he's leaning all the way back. He's got his feet up crossed on the desk. He's wearing Vince's glasses and dancing to Brett's music. (laughs) Brett Hart comes out, and of course, he demands that they play the Canadian National Anthem. And 
they play the anthem and he's standing there in the ring and he's looking up at the screen where they've got the flag or whatever. And Sean's in the background mocking everything. And Brett is so awesome. You can just see how angry he is. But he's trying very hard not to sell it. Yes. And every now and then he kind of glances to the side and he sees Sean in his peripheral vision. And he's just, you see steam coming out of his ears as this man is disrespecting his national anthem. He cannot believe this motherfucker is disrespecting his national anthem. So then the Patriot comes out. The Patriot says, I think we should play my national anthem here as well. Golly! So they play the national Andy anthem. Andy Griffith is the Patriot. <laughs> the national anthem. He may be! Or Jim Neighbors. That's better. Plays the national anthem, and Brett has his back to the screen where the American flag is waving. He's turned his back. And all he's doing is his le- he's leaning over the ropes, and he's looking off into space, and you can see more and more steam coming out of his ears. And he doesn't have to say anything... And he's not playing it up too big, but you just know that in his mind, he is so pissed off right now that these fuckers have got the temerity to play this American National Anthem during his match. And finally, he turns around and he attacks the Patriot during the American National Anthem. Like the biggest asshole in the world. But in his mind, he's justified because of all these terrible things that they've done to him when he was in Canada. And the best part is, as he's stomping a hole in the Patriots, yes. they keep playing the national We're anthem. Gonna finish this song, damn it! Brett was. This is why I love this show. Brett was so fucking amazing. There were people. There's two types of people in this world: wrestling fans. There are the people that think that Bret Hart is one of the greatest wrestlers that there has ever been. And they're the people that hate Bret Hart and they think he took all of this too seriously and that he was a mark. Can't you be both? No. Okay. The latter people are flat out wrong. Because what this business needs is more people like Bret who take this shit seriously. This this business was not a joke to Bret Hart. This was not something to laugh about. He had a fucking room in his house with all of his belts behind him. I mean, can you imagine? But the point is, he took this shit seriously. Okay? That's why he was so great. That was why he was such a great heel, and that's why he was such a great babyface. And if we had more people that took it seriously like Bret Hart, it would be a better business. Amen. And we need more rivalries like Bret and Sean, where you knew that they fucking hated each other. Is there one rivalry in WWE today where you think, you know what? Something could go wrong if you get these two men in the ring together. There ain't one! Everyone and Steph. Because you imagine that all of these guys, when the show is over, they all get in the same car for an episode of Ride Along, and then they go fucking swerve each other, and then they go play video games in the hotel. So Kara and the Vaudevillain. Yeah, that's their next main event viewed there. Kind of. But, I mean, do you really think that if they got in the ring together, they'd, they'd shoot? No. But no. Moreover, would you care? <laughs> no. More to the point. No, you no. don't fucking care. These were the two top guys in the company, and you knew they fucking hated each other. Yeah. God, it was great. And they played each other. Sean was so fucking annoying, and he tried to push every single button. And with Brett, it was easy. Brett's buttons to push are because, pushable. And same with Sean. Neither guy was able to block the troll to put the other guy on ignore (laughs) they weren't able to do it they were the guys on the message board that you just can't step away from the computer Mm. you've just got to keep arguing you've just got to keep tweeting and they both played each other like a fiddle it's a fucking thing of beauty how did they both not get banned (laughs) one of them did so about seven or eight minutes into the match, the ref gets bumped. Brett hits a pile driver. No ref. He uh, tries another cover, but Sean hits the ring, pulls him off. So Brett's now outraged. Ref's down. Patriot is down. Sean's back outside of the ring. Brett is standing up in the ring, looking at Sean. You motherfucker. Turns around, wakes up the ref, and then goes to point at Sean. This guy pulled me out of the ring. And as he's protesting, P- 
Patriot schoolboys when the ref counts three. And the Patriot gets the big upset win on the go-home show for SummerSlam. My only complaint with this is Earl Hebner used to always do those slow, dramatic counts for a dramatic finish. Yeah. But the problem was, he was so slow here. Yeah. And then it was like they fucked Brett. He was counted down for like a five count. <laughs> yeah, it's like the Americans fucked the guy again. But that's his whole point, though. Well, he had a it point fits here. Story. He definitely had a point here. I'll tell you that much. So Brett is furious. He goes out to the Patriot. But he gets held back, and Sean's dancing on the announce desk. And Brett goes to c- confront him. And Undertaker's dong sounds, and the smoke of the ramp, and the show goes off the air. The last uh, twenty minutes was the, fabulous. the last twenty minutes of the show was great. Fabulous. Nothing. Brett and Sean. The, 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 uh, you know, I'll say a half hour because he had the arm wrestling match too. Honestly, the closer we get to this tr- the screw job, I start to really understand what a tragedy it was. <laughs> this is almost over. It's over in November. Yep. It's basically August right now. Yeah. There's three months left and then it's over. Well, <laughs> except how they brought it up on every show for the next 15 years. Well, that's true. And it did pick up in other ways afterwards, but. Oh, and then we get Brett's awesome run in WCW. Oh, yeah, sure. Well, speaking of uh, uh, what's 